good afternoon, everyone. Councilmember Dustin Hillis, Chair of the Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. I'm joined by my immediate right, Councilwoman Boone, to my left, Councilmember Waits, followed by Councilmember Norwood, followed by Councilmember Overstreet, and we've just been joined by our Vice Chair, Councilmember Amos. I'll call this meeting to order. I will make a motion to approve the agenda. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councilmember Overstreet. Please prepare the vote. The vote is open. Please vote. The vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. Uh, Councilmember Amos is present. How would you like to vote, Councilmember Amos? Uh, that moves us to six yeas, zero nays. The agenda is adopted. I'll then make a motion to approve the minutes of the prior meeting. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councilmember Norwood. Please prepare the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Six yeas, zero nays. It is approved. We will now move to public comment. Each speaker will get three minutes. First, we have Henri Jordan. Be to God to everyone that's here. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him, curse them that cursed thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Genesis 12 and 3. If you seek to bless me, ye shall be blessed. If you seek to curse me, ye shall be cursed. These actions bless his families. When you seek to curse me, James, if you ask to be cursed. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Matthew 18 and 6. Offenses are viewed as reality that must be accepted in the present world. But woe, prophetic condemnation to death to the one who is the source of the offense. You ask for death when you intentionally put your behinds in my face. Therefore, I make a decree that every people, nation, and language will speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces and the houses shall be made a dunghill because there is no other God that can deliver after this sword. Daniel 3, chapter 29, verse. Nebuchadnezzar's recognition of the God of the three men does not mean that he converted to their religion. It was simply an acknowledgement of their God power. If you don't acknowledge what Jesus has done in me, how can I give it to you? Persecuted but not forsaken. Cast down but not destroyed. Second Corinthians 4 chapter 19 verse. Yet it resides in men of clay that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. I can only give Christ the glory, not myself or any other person, and work to give his way to pass it to those who desire to be used by Jesus. Perfectly, the homeless calling on Jesus. God created the money for the poor, for the homeless. And you taking it, the government is taking it, use it for their glory and not God's glory. We need God. He don't need us. Next is Carolyn Hall. Uh, good afternoon. It's great to be here with all of you. Uh, I have, I'm coming with a concern. I'm Carolyn Hall, a retired uh, Atlanta Public Schools principal. I've been living... Uh, downtown Atlanta at Re Renaissance Lofts for the past uh, close to 15 years. And uh, 
We have our building has a lot of concerns. We're right there at the, the intersection of Ralph McGill and Cortland, right where the stitch is going to be eventually erected, and we're across from the Folk Art Park. The Folk Art Park has, um, the last few months, had ongoing homeless encampments and um, they're not being cleared. Um, we have residents that have seen, um, they say it's drug deals going on. We've reported it to our city council person. But just recently, um, Friday night and Saturday night, we've had some concerning things where uh, folks from the encampment have um, had uh, arguments in front of our building, broke a six foot uh, glass in the front area of our building which is currently boarded and uh, we have a school in the building right next door the Boyce Ansley School I don't know if you're familiar with it but it is a school for homeless children um, just last night a window was broken in uh, the school uh, Friday night we had uh, someone to enter our building come in from the parking deck get into our pry the door open, get into our vending area and vandalize the vending area and also try to uh, steal from our ATM machine. And last night we had another person uh, break into the building and um, was in our bathroom for uh, over an hour and a half before they could get him removed. Uh, police reports have been made. but. The bottom line is that we're concerned about the activity at Folk Art Park. There's been shootings there in the past. There have been murders. And we would just like it serviced on a regular basis so that um, people who are taking advantage of the situation are just in camping out there and committing all kinds of, of unlawful acts. And it's just spilling out into our area on Ralph McGill. So that's what I wanted to share with you. I'm uh, representing my community of uh, Renaissance Lofts. Thank you. All right, before we move ahead, I want to acknowledge I've been joined by Council Member Bond and our Council President, Doug Shipman. Next is Prophet T. Curtis Harrison. Uh, again, good afternoon, everybody. I just wanted to finish on what I was saying at the early, early um, meeting when it came to when it, when it comes to uh, the model bus department. Now, model bus system. Now, they write me a ticket for coming through the gate without paying. So, in the process of this, you're going to handcuff me and handcuff me to the wall over two dollars and fifty cent, and I'm walking past people cussing me out. I'm walking past people smoking marijuana. Cops right over there and ain't saying nothing. See, that's the, that's the problem with this model police. Now, if I had gotten a confrontation with the model police, then it would have got worse. See, and then I'm going to call lawyers and then I'm going to call the TV station and then I'm going to bring the board attention to that, what happened. See, that's the problem. See, but it's like no one's paying attention. Again, like what the lady said, well, homelessness, and I agree with you. That's threatening, but that's why we need homeless shelters. That's why we need homeless shelters to get these homeless people off the street. See, we we playing kick and boodle, right? Move the homeless people here, move the homeless people there, homeless people go there. If you build shelters, you will not have homeless people on the street. Common sense. Okay, now again, now we I'm, I want to bring some a little attention to model police and how some. Model police are create doing their citizens like this lady that got brutally beaten in the parking lot with her boyfriend or husband after hours at a park. Now, now I know all of us went to school and we graduated. Who ain't going to the park after dark? I guarantee everybody in this room have been through the park after in after hours. I bet you. You going to arrest a woman? After I was at a park, and these two people were just chilling. I can see what they were throwing beer bottles all over the place. Something's not right. This man on top of this woman, beating her down like that. Another black man beating a black woman down like that. That's a red flag to me. Now, I'm, this is live. This is, that had been my sister. 
to do the math. Now, I'm telling you, if that had been my sister, you do the math. Okay? I'm a prophet of God. But, but don't, 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 don't let that fool you, though. I am a prophet, but don't let that fool you. If that had been my sister, do the math. Now, like I said before, some need to be done about how some model police are handling their citizens. Now, I can go deeper. I can go deeper. And I can make it plainer. Something needs to be done. Now, I know this man got duly, man's foot. Rashad Brooks got killed by the police at Winters Parking Lot, right? In his neighborhood. You know what they say, what they told me when I was in the 10th grade? No justice, no peace. This is Kyle Rudler. I thank you for you guys' time today, um, and I apologize for sending so many emails. Uh, this is a very important topic. Uh, I'm here specifically to speak about school safety, and I've been to every other city council that has taken place in the last two months through DeKalb County, all of the, the smaller cities, and I also spoke at the Board of Education for DeKalb County, but everywhere I go, I only get three minutes, so it's really hard to go through this entire topic, but all of you guys have seen the news and know what's going on with all of the school violence and stuff, and the packet that I've passed out has a lot of really common sense solutions that wouldn't talk a lot, or cost a lot for us to implement, and it's really a lot of things that need to be addressed from the parents' perspective, including mothers. I mean, my wife and our two daughters, every day we drop them off at school, but they go to a private school. None of the private schools have any coverage whatsoever from the current plans at the public level. So, like, if a private school incident were to occur, they would dial 911, and then the response time would be, at the best, five to seven minutes if someone's in the area, but then maybe even longer, depending on how many uh, police are not around at that time because they're responding to other stuff maybe in a different area. And I think the uh, shortage of teachers could be addressed by having better uh, security at the schools. Um, another thing I wanted to mention is that this issue is uniting for everyone. It doesn't matter what color you are or what religion you believe in or what uh, gender you are or any of your beliefs outside of just safety in general. All of us have children, so we want our kids to go to school and feel like they can learn and concentrate on what their teacher is saying and not try to you know, have nightmares and wonder what's going to happen or just their last day at school. And then that will also eliminate a lot of the homeschooling because parents will put their kids back in the public schools and not feel like they have to tend to them at home. Um, I've been on several podcasts um, that I've talked about all this issue. And then also I would love the opportunity to speak with some of the legislators at the state level. And I know a lot of you guys know them. I'm just one person, so I can scream really loud, but it doesn't do a lot. But you guys could make one phone call and have me in the room with them. So that's what I'm here to do is ask you to endorse Parent Safety Alliance. I would love for you to draft a resolution supporting us and put it on the public record so that we can present that to Governor Kemp. There's over $5 billion with a B of money that's undesignated in the Georgia surplus that is laying around over and beyond the rainy day fund they're supposed to keep on hand. So this money, you know, before the election is going to be sent out to his buddies and anybody who owns a company for infrastructure or whatever they're doing, and they'll get the money. But I think 20% of it, which would be $1 billion, should be put towards every school in this state. But I need the city of Atlanta because you guys have the political clout to help me. And I, I've lived in Atlanta for 41 years. I love this city, but I need y'all's help. So if there's any, and if there's a ton of information on our Facebook page if you look at it. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Next is Chris Brown. Chris Brown. Good afternoon, uh, Chris Brown, Atlanta, um, Atlanta Planning Advisory Board, Public Safety Chair. Uh, I just came before you because we wanted to participate in the process as we talk about the nuisance property uh, ordinance um, as it relates to the businesses in the community. Um, 
a little past history is that last year we started a community blitz series in response to a lot of the violent things that was going on. This was before the administration actually took office, uh, where we tried to partner with business communities and neighborhood associations and neighborhood groups to come together to bring about immediate change to beautification and addressing needs of the community through wraparound services. We partnered with Anise, um, PAD, um, ACRB. Collectively, we came together to address the immediate needs that's in the community. We started to have positive input and change. I think that the Merchant Association may have raised uh, up to like $50,000 to go toward their public safety plan. And so where, come, where businesses are trying to come together, we have been a viable solution, a solution and vessel to help merge the community engagement part, um, portion of that. And I know that there's another group through the administration um, it's just a lot of moving parts. And we just want to be a part of it to make sure that the community has input and buy-in to all of the things that is being decided. So um, with whatever consideration that you all have, allow us to be uh, a vessel, a part of that. We would have had a meeting last week, but the, we was going to be meeting in this room, but we didn't get confirmation back from the city. So we will be rescheduling that meeting to continue to have the dialogue with the business associations and the other businesses that are not covered in the business associations. That's one disconnect that we found is that there's a big disconnect in how we're communicating the roles of the businesses, the roles of the community, uh, other than liquor license going through the NPUs, they have no other engagement uh, if, they're, if they're an establishment that actually has a liquor license. Um, but if there was opportunity, the pilot program started in little five points um, last July. Um, that's where you had a precinct that had been there 20 years, um, a mini precinct in that community. For during the pandemic, um, they had to change the leadership. And so what we found is that it was a grand opportunity to stay partnered with the city to do some of the programming and things we want to do with 21st century policing, some of the other uh, initiatives that we've been doing around the city. So I think that with us as a collective coming to the table, that will allow us to have more dialogue and input about best practices. Uh, I think that we see some things about how we engage as elected officials, community leaders, um, the schools, they're a, big, they're, they're, they're a big agency, they need to be a part of the conversation. And so being able to do this without them uh, shows a disservice. So please give that consideration as we move forward uh, in this communication. That concludes our public comment section. We'll now move on to presentations. Uh, we first have APD's bi-weekly update, Deputy Chief Peak. Morning, uh, Deputy Chief Peak, Atlanta Police Department, Community Services Division. It's certainly always a pleasure to uh, be here and uh, to provide our bi weekly presentation to the City Council. As we move forward with that in respect of time, just want to share with you our data for week 32 as where we stand with crime with the City of Atlanta. So as we look, we have an overall, we've had a substantial uh, decrease in our overall crime numbers year to date, which is at 6% at this particular point in time. And represented in that overall 6% year to date is a 3% um, with violent crime and 7% with our property crime. As we continuously look at our 28 day period, which really gives us about a month, and then we compare a month to the previous month to see what our crime trends are. We've uh, had a reasonable reduction as we talk about an overall reduction of a 5% decrease with uh, overall crime. Our property crimes at a 7% decrease, and then the violent crime, the unfortunate, we've seen a slight spike with that, with the, which are 5% increase in our violent crimes is what we're seeing with those. It's no different than what we've experienced throughout the uh, beginning of this year to forward, escalating disputes that are ending in gunfire and other types of uh, issues. Uh, a couple stabbings, but they're generally nine times out of 10, uh, a known source. Oftentimes, we very well may get uh, consider not consideration but participation from the victims oftentimes the victims won't cooperate with the actual investigation and we have to utilize other means makes it a little bit harder to solve but the good thing is our solvability is still extremely high on most of our incidents and so uh, we're thankful for the good hard work that our homicide team and all our other crime scene techs when they're coming out and working the crime scenes to ensure that we collect the data that we need all of the evidence forensics and all of those we're having a lot 
lot of success from those particular numbers. So uh, we're certainly ecstatic about that and we'll continue. As we looked at this particular week, it was a 14% increase overall for the actual week. And uh, what that basically just means is this appears to be, as we've had the last three weeks, we had two weeks where we had significant decreases. Then for this particular uh, period, which was prior to those, this was a one up for this week being up. But crime numbers are certainly trending as we see the year-to-date number continuously to decrease with what we're seeing with um, our data. Just to share with you moving forward, this is a situation on how we're responding. Naturally, our targets is to really and truly uh, deal with the gangs, the drugs, and the um, the guns that are in the wrong, the illegal guns, I should say. We're fine with people who are actually uh, having weapons and doing what they need to do with them, but the illegal guns is where our challenges continue to focus. We really want to just highlight this one. This is a 700 block of Terra Circle in the south end of our city to where we were able to uh, get a complaint on some narcotics activity. And so we had our narcotics unit and violent crime interdiction team to really and truly look at this location and based off of what they were able to find, they were able to get a search warrant and serve it at this particular location. Uh, as you'll see right here in the presentation there, weapons are always the challenge. Whenever we're looking at narcotics, there's always a weapon that's going along with it. In this particular case, a 223 rifle, which is a weapon that we are kind of oftentimes seeing on our crime scenes. It's a very deadly weapon considered in the assault rifle well um, means. And so we really and truly like to get those out of the hands of our violent people. Uh, along with that, we have a 45 caliber pistol and uh, the evidence that they were doing within this particular uh, location, <clears throat> they were uh, holding about 300, just below three pounds of marijuana and about 770 grams of uh, marijuana THC edibles. And so we were able to make an arrest on that. With that particular arrest, what we're finding is that the individual that was in there conducting these crimes had a pretty extremely violent history of about 18 cycles in the state of Georgia. But as you see, there's a lot of, um, a lot of evidence right there that we were able to present to the court. And so our hope is that as we continue to look at these cases, not only do we file them in superior court, but based off the victim's history, criminal history, and what he's looking at, we present those cases also to our U.S. attorney, and oftentimes they will adopt those cases and take them federally, give them more time, and to really and truly alleviate what we're seeing and some of the issues or challenges uh, that we're having sometimes with the backlog in Fulton County. I'll say Fulton has been outstanding. They have worked with us. They respond to our critical scenes and really, truly partner with us to get the cases that we need to get in there, but we know that there are some individuals that we need to take a different approach with and so they're also a part of the team of reviewing that information and ensuring that we have a swift transition over to our federal partners. Additionally, want to highlight on this other particular case that took place in the 3200 block of Lenox Road. Again, um, we were Major Mitchell in Zone 2 was given some information about a lot of activity that was taking place on the property, and so they went out and conducted a thorough investigation, spent a lot of time up there when they was, was able to uh, develop probable cause to uh, get a search warrant to go to this location. Uh, once inside, as you see some of the things that they were able to uh, take into custody, to um, seize 31 pounds of marijuana, four pounds of edibles again, 113 grams of MDNA, 113 packs of THC grapes, oxycodone pills, and of course, Aruga 5.7 weapon, which is a very deadly weapon. It's a handgun, but it shoots a projectile like a rifle. So it's a very deadly weapon with some specialized uh, rounds on it. So again, we were happy to get this stuff off of the streets. Looking at this particular person, he had about 20 cycles, 20 arrest cycles within the state of Georgia. And this particular location was set up just like a store. Had a menu board inside and the whole nine yards. So this is just a testament to what we're seeing in our communities and what the Atlanta Police Department is focused on and ensuring that we get it all off the uh, streets as soon as we can. So we're thankful again for our units for dealing with that. 
And as we look at it and we talk about violent crime, repeat offenders. So for this particular reporting period, the weapons charges, we didn't have any repeat offenders within those, but we were able to get some guns. But of course, what we focus on is the violent crimes. Consistently at 28%, violent crimes, property crimes, and narcotics is what we're seeing with the um, repeat offender issues. Uh, one, event, one individual f arrested 47 times. 47 times. So uh, when we talk about first, second, and third chances, I think we've uh, really and truly went above and beyond with that one. And so as we see those types of incidents, working with our repeat offender tracking unit, we're able to get the data, look at it, and present that problem to the court so that they'll know that this is not a person that needs to be released back out onto the street, but we'll keep them in. So ultimately, we're looking also forward to continuing to work with the DA's office as they reestablish the, the uh, community prosecutors so that we can really keep a focus on the individuals that we need to keep on the street and then divert those individuals that we know that they've proven that they need a second chance or a hand up to get them where they need to be. So as we talk about park patrols, um, we know that parks have been a challenge recently with a couple critical incidents. Speaking of Wilson Mill as well as our Rosa Bernie Park, so uh, our mounted patrol unit has really and truly spent an enormous amount of time with a detail. I think they've had about 368 visits to our public parks and they on an average spend a considerable amount of time with about 25, anywhere from 20 to 25 of our highest tier parks that we've received the most issues with on a weekly basis. Uh, as we look at it, as it says, since week 17, May 1st, they've had 368 park visits. Again, average of 21 different parks each week. And we did deploy a uh, trailer, a, a camera trailer to Rosa Bernie Park to ensure that we were able to really and truly look at it through the video integration center to ensure that we're not seeing any activity that's concerning but uh, certainly looking at that as a target for zone three of those areas and also addressing zone four where they had their challenges with Wilson Mill. And finally as we talk about the technology and helping us fight crime so our updated numbers as we're looking at the connect Atlanta program through FUSIS so our numbers now we're looking at um, and the registered cameras of 4850 and integrated cameras are now up to 8664, which actually gives us, I believe, a 2000 um, camera integration and uh, registration since a month ago. So we're certainly seeing movement in that. So we're thankful for you all because what we're doing is certainly sharing it with you because we know we need your input and your, and your uh, help as far as getting the word out. Of course, we're looking at the NPU meetings and community meetings really and truly pushing that number out there so that we can continue to have that network to grow. The, six, the, good, the great thing about it is we can push this information to every single patrol car in the city of Atlanta that has an MDT in it. So not only is it a video integration, a real-time tracking center, but we're elevating it to the level of a network because we have so much connectivity with all of our officers. So thank you. And uh, I know that that was a question earlier about whether or not we could actually get that onto the APD's page so that people will have more awareness. And so we were thankful for our public affairs and really truly pushing and driving that. We were able to successfully get that link added to the Atlanta Police Department's website. So if someone's perusing, they'll see it right there and be able to click on it, learn about the system, and then get the processes to either register or integrate their own. So uh, this concludes the presentation for what's here with our slides, but of course, we're always here to answer whatever additional questions you might have. Colleagues, we've got some people signed up here. Uh, Council Member Bond, if you'd like to speak, please indicate on your screen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, um, Chief Peake, for your presentation and your good work always. I just have a few uh, concerns. You mentioned uh, the Parks Patrol. Now, my understanding is that the legislation that approves um, the vendor to hire off-duty police officers to have them patrol in the parks, do you know where that stands? Because I thought that was going to be on our agenda this month. We, uh, we have not. There was that piece that went forward, but I believe that that was some type of a holdup with that piece. We had not gotten the actual interest that we needed for our off-duty and or our recaptured people. 
to really and truly make that a robust program. So it's something that we're still working on, but in the meantime, we're utilizing our own due to resources that we have uh, established that could set aside time to really and truly be in that place. But it's still an ongoing push to try to uh, get to a better place on those. No, I, I understand that, but my understanding was that the contract, I guess it's really more a question for procurement, because they were saying that this would be the cycle that the uh, awarded contract would come before us, but you don't have any don't have that specific update. I'm not certain if uh, Mr. Amon, if, but no, we don't, we don't have that update, and so we'll have to do a little homework on that one to see where that piece is. Would you? And so when we uh, come back at the next meeting, because when I made, when they awarded the contract, I guess a couple of months ago, and they said it would be this cycle of legislation that it would come before us. We'll be happy to follow up with it and find okay. out. But I wanted to ask you about the uh, clean car break-ins and how uh, APD is now handling uh, car break-ins. I know under the previous chief, if there was, let's say, a, uh, several break-ins at a particular location, they were counting it as one incident of car break-ins for that location, even though it might have been multiple cars that got broken into. Is that still the current policy at APD, or how are you all handling that now? Has anything changed? So we actually report crime based off the FBI guidelines, and so the FBI guidelines state that when you have a specific a number of issues that are happening at the very same time with, specific, with specificity to vehicle break-ins, that those are grouped as one incident. However, we're, ca we're capturing every single vehicle through their reporting program, which is why you're oftentimes not just for your car break-ins, but even for your aggravated assaults. There may be one incident that will take place, but it could be 12 people inside the house. Only one round will go through, but because of 12 people there, then we'll, that'll capture us as far as having 12 aggravated assaults. Um, but those guidelines are established through the FBI through the new NIBR system. Okay, so nothing's changed. Nothing has changed to that specific where we can't group those together. That's what the, that's what the orders are. Uh, but I guess the, the, the follow-up or adjacent to that is that when these incidents occur, I know that at least for the last 12 years, APD has been trying to convince folks to be a part of the clean car campaign make sure they don't have obviously visible uh, things to tantalize thieves to break into their vehicles. Have you all considered, I guess, using some of the public notification systems, whether it's a email or, you know, heaven forbid, a robocall to a vicinity or area to remind people that there have been a car, there has been a car break in and kind of putting people on notice, reminding them that because of the proximity of the crime, perhaps they might be more aware or, or uh, they, they, they might <laughs> show more of a predilection to participate in the clean car campaign if they know something has happened down the block or around the corner or within a mile of their home. Right. So what else? We have not actually utilized cellular technology to send bursts out to people in those particular areas. Historically, what we have done is really and truly the areas that were where we've seen high concentration is to get out there with our cops unit to have awareness going out passing flyers, working with the business owners, making sure that they have proper signage and lighting in some of those parking lots. And so we continue to push that, and I think we uh, really and truly very well could be challenging from that piece just to be able to find out with the number of break-ins that are taking place, how we're able to uh, effectively push out a technology burst. But I think the main thing is we have to continue to push that knowledge out and share it. And so I know that there are some who may say, well, my car was clean, but I was still broken into. Well, the challenge is, is if we keep all the cars clean, but although that one was clean, the one next to it, very well could have had something so until we collectively and consistently keep them clean to where people realize when they're breaking in 
they're not coming up with anything good anymore, then that's when the criminal decides to really and truly focus it or leave that type of crime alone. So I think we still we have to continue the clean car campaign and continue to push that information out as you state and uh, ensure that we get some compliance with all of our citizens. And the other challenge is being able to reach those that come into the city but don't live in the city and don't have the awareness that our residents inside have. So we have to continue to share it. But what I'll also say is they're experiencing the exact same trends now even throughout our metro area. So it's a challenge for us all. Okay. But well, before I leave that subject, is how many is it how many guns that have you all recovered that have been stolen from cars or how many guns have actually been stolen from cars? I don't have the specific data, but I think the last time I looked at it, it was somewhere around like 800 or so, if I can remember from about the last data from a few weeks ago. So um, far too many, far too many. And so uh, I know that we're looking at it right now, trying to do a deep dive to look at it and associate some of the weapons that have been taken from vehicles and where those weapons have been utilized in serious crimes as far as violent crimes, homicides, shootings of such. So we really and truly try to track that data so that we can show people you can't leave a weapon inside of a vehicle or unsecured inside a home. You have to take the measures needed to secure those weapons so that they don't get in the hands of our number one criminals and for number two children so that we don't have unfortunate incidents like we had just recently overnight in another jurisdiction. So we want to continue to share that educational piece with people. Okay, and then the, the last thing I wanted to ask about, I know it seems like McDaniel Street's been bad as long as I've been in Atlanta. You know, like there's always some type of uh, incident uh, in and around that corridor, even you know, across the, the, the streets that it crosses. Uh, had, just out of curiosity, any of this uh, stuff that's been going on and that related to the incident that happened this weekend, uh, is any of that directly gang related? Is the gang unit involved in some of that? So on the preliminary, preliminary side, we'll go out and we'll conduct the investigation and do a deep dive to all of those that have been involved. I have not gotten a report at this particular moment that we've connected any individual to a gang, but that's a part of the investigation. All homicides, shootings, we give up, we push all of that information over to the gang unit so that they can take a deep dive and find out who the individuals are, who their associations are, and uh, from there we're able to really and truly add those gang charges where needed. And the very last thing, I did see uh, on the news the arrest of the individual that was operating the is uh, who you referenced in your report who was operating the store in his in his Buckhead uh, apartment with the store board and the pricing and all that kind of thing. And I wondered, do you all ever follow up with the, the landlord who allowed that person to lease? Because apparently he had been in a apartment in Southwest Atlanta mm -hmm. a couple of years ago. And then so they were doing, a, I guess, an adequate uh, background check of where he's leased before that they would have discovered that he had had the same similar type of operation so why would they they lease to you know subsequently lease to him do you all question the landlords or making those kind of inquiries about the, the history of some of these individuals able to set up shop so when we're dealing with private residences yes we'll actually always if it's a rented property lease or whatever the case may be go back to the owner for number one to do a premise history to look and see if it's been a problem location before and if so what was done working with also law department to ensure that we get out cease and desist notices so that we can stop the activity in the commercial apartments which is where this particular location was is a little bit different because they have so many now granted they're going to lease to who they lease to but our challenge is, is to ensure that we have a great relationship with them because not only will we deal with that one location, but we're certain that there will be other locations that will need information. But we generally establish a great relationship with them so that when we're having information, we can get what we need with a two-way communication to try to resolve the issue and, and help them because, quite frankly, sometimes they're victims as well. So we have to thank you, Deputy Chief. And I withdraw, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir. Next is Councilmember... Amos. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. Afternoon. Um, 
in, re in regards to your park patrol, um, it's specifically mounted, I mean, stated mounted patrol, but are they all mounted or are you sending foot cars or whatever officers to that? So we're, we're utilizing for this specific report was what our mounted patrol was really getting out into the community and making an impact on the parks. But yes, our beat officers and all of our specialized units are conducting those park patrols uh, in between calls or whatever the case may be if they have an opportunity. Yes, they'll go through those parks, look at it, and then some of the other challenging parks, what happens is during those overnight issues, you'll see uh, we're, we're having units go into those parks during the after hours, really trying to find out who's in there and who shouldn't be in, well, nobody should be in there after 11 o'clock anyway. So um, that was, I know, one of the issues we had here recently where there was a uh, incident that went through social media, but it was an officer doing what he was told, which is to be proactive and patrol in our parks as well. And so, yes, everyone's in the park. I had three other questions, but you just answered them all. Uh, when you mentioned the beat officers out there and then what we're doing while we're out there, um, quality of life crimes and things of that nature, or non-suggestive uses of our parks. So um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll see any other speakers in the queue. Um, <clears throat> Deputy Chief, I did have a question uh, that I relate to uh, Interim Chief Sherbaum about. We wanted to update on our 911 current operations and any issues. I believe Mr. Amon may have that. Yes. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Peter Amon, Chief Administrative Officer of the Atlanta Police Department. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak on the 911 Center. I'm going to make just a couple comments and then we'll be. Oh, those are mine. Sorry, we're having a slight mix up. The police are trying to take my cell phone. <laughs> I got two, but go ahead. We'll just go. I'll just borrow. Make sure that's reported. Sorry, I just the you got to keep track of your stuff. This is why you keep your car clean. Uh, so, so just a couple comments on the 911 center. Uh, two things can be true at once, obviously, and and this is certainly the case in our 911 center. The first thing is that we have tremendously dedicated men and women uh, in our 911 center uh, answering calls, working very hard 24 hours a day, every day of the year. And I just want to take this opportunity to thank uh, the uh, men and women of the center. I want to thank uh, Director Arnold and Deputy Director Solis for all their hard work. Um, and we really have a full court press on trying to answer uh, every call uh, professionally, dispatch our officers, work with Grady and so forth. So that's the first thing that is true. It is also true, however, uh, that at this time and for a number of months leading up to this time, in fact, a number of years leading up to this time, the performance of our 911 center as measured by hold times is not at all what we want. Uh, we have hold times that are way past national standard uh, and there are parts of the day where things are okay and then there are parts of the day where they're decidedly not okay. Um, and so the director and deputy director are going to talk uh, more specifically about a whole variety of actions we're taking. Um, but just as with, as is the case with sworn police officers, um, one of our key constraints is staffing. We have many, many vacancies in the 911 center. Um, and we are working hard to try and recruit for those vacancies. I spend pretty much a portion of every day trying to figure out uh, in my new role how I can help uh, recruiting. Uh, we're also looking uh, at incentives and a variety of other things that we can do, whether it's cross-training and uh, other members of the department or, or other members of the city and so forth. Um, but it is a hard job. It takes several months of training just to get the basics and then it takes six to nine months to become proficient uh, or even close to proficient. Uh, so it's not something you can just uh, flip a switch. So um, as I said, I'll be happy to answer questions in a second, but let me have Director Arnold talk about the response times and then uh, Deputy Director Solis is going to talk about some technology that will have some significant uh, impact, if that's okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you. <coughs> Much taller. I'm Director Arnold, Atlanta PD 911, and I'll go over some um, stats with you all. We were we kind of got this last minute, so I don't have a slide for you, but I will. I can provide that information for you at a later date. Uh, right now, for 2022, our average wait time is 30.94 seconds. That is um, down from what we have had before. And just last week, it was down to 26.01 seconds. So we are trending 
in the right direction. Uh, the percentage of calls that are answered under 25, 20 seconds for last week was 75.39, which of course is not where we want it to be, but again, those that are holding on average are holding about 26 seconds. Um, also, we have, of course, increased our recruiting efforts. We're down in resignations. We're down to 11 this year to date. Uh, last year, we were at 19. Um, we have five people that want to return back into um, Atlanta 911, so we're working to bring them back as well. In the, those resignations that we've had, two of those, we lost to 311, which of course offers work from home opportunities. They don't have to work weekends, holidays, things of that nature. Um, two were unable to successfully complete their probationary standards. And we had one person that decided she wanted to become an attorney. So some of those, those reasonings behind those resignations have definitely um, changed. Uh, we have started trying to accommodate a more work-life balance. We're working on splitting that 3 to 11. Those that need to come in and work 11 to 7, we're allowing them to do that. Those that need to come in and work 7 to 3, we're allowing them to do that so that we can cover those, those time periods that are we receive the most calls. Um, keep in mind that there are times when we're receiving two to 300 calls in an hour, and that makes it very difficult to answer every call at the point of receipt, especially with the number of staff that we have. Um, let's see, what else do I have? All right, and then we have a new phone system. Of course, I'll let Deputy Director Solis kind of talk about the implementation of the Viper system. That's something we've been talking about probably for the past year or better. Uh, we're finally um, in the final stages of getting that, and I'll let her go into detail about what that system will allow us to do as it relates to call answer time. But again, everyone's working extremely hard to make sure that these calls are answered. Uh, last year, I call taker that took the most calls took 38,000 calls in a year. And so you can only imagine what that does not only to the day-to-day -day operations but to the mental state. So we're trying to make sure that we are taking care of our employees as well. We're not trying to overwork them, but we're also trying to make sure that we're there to do our job. So let me let um, Deputy Director Stoley speak about the technology upgrades that we're looking to make, and then we'll be more than happy to answer any questions that you have. Good afternoon, Ryan Solis, Deputy Director for E911 APD. Um, so as um, Director Arnold stated, we've probably all heard about the phone upgrade already. We're extremely excited about it. It's actually underway. Um, we have got AT&T and our Entrato vendors on site now pulling cable, um, configuring. Um, the reason that we're here today to talk about that is because I think that will substantially help some of these hold times. I know that um, we've previously described this to you, but for those in the room that are not familiar, um, a couple years ago, TSA um, invented pre-check, so everybody is familiar with that, whereas they may not be familiar with 911 processes. So what we have now is everybody going through the TSA line, everybody dialing 911, whether it's a 10-digit number or a three-digit 911 number, they're all going through that same line to get to us. What we're essentially doing is implementing a process like TSA pre-check. We're saying that by virtue of dialing an inbound three-digit 911 line, we know that you have a higher prioritized emergency than someone who's dialing us on a 10-digit line to ask questions about an or a noise ordinance or make a complaint about a crime already occurred, something like that. We're able to better triage that, better service those, give them to the operators first um, while subsequently allowing the 10-digit callers to hold for a couple seconds more, however long until we get to those calls. So that upgrade will allow that queue process. Um, another big feature of this is that people don't often think about it, but our 911 lines, we are currently not able to place on hold. So I cannot, I cannot talk to somebody who's dialed inbound 911 and say, hey, hold on just a second. Um, you know, we're getting an influx of calls on the interstate. We may have a huge traffic accident. Let me put you on hold. We cannot do that. We have to go ahead and process and complete the call or disconnect with them and then make an outbound to touch base with them again. Because of our call volume and because our operators are um, on average every three seconds receiving a new call once they disconnect with a previous caller, 
there's just not a lot of time to make another outbound call to make sure that we service people and so we don't want to forget them and so we just have a practice of going ahead and processing and handling the call that we are on before we go on to the next one being able to place them on hold and then return to them um, is again a new feature that I think will assist us when looking at some of the statistics we take depending on the day anywhere from 10 to 15 sometimes upward to 20 percent of our call load is from those 10 digit lines so we'll be able to displace those and divert those temporarily to handle the emergencies better and that's really from a technology perspective um, I think our biggest success with um, call hold times one <clears throat> one final comment I would make and obviously uh, we certainly want to take questions we really do need the public's help here, particularly as we await the uh, arrival of, of more staff, as we await the uh, introduction of better infrastructure. We need people not to call 911 for small reasons. I think you've seen probably some of the publicity we've pushed out, but people calling 911 to have a spider killed uh, is not a thing. That's not what you should be doing. To find your glasses. Uh, that's not something you should be calling 911 for. Uh, we had a gentleman who called because he was waiting too long at a red light and claimed to be uh, to be being held hostage by the red light. Um, that that's just that's not acceptable. So while we certainly want people to call 911 when they see a suspicious suspicious person, when they believe there is something wrong, when there is a true emergency, absolutely call 911. But if it's something that is not an emergency, don't call 911. We we do have the 311 center for reporting potholes for talking uh, to the city uh, for asking about uh, city services and other things so just a uh, uh, we need the public's help on that certainly happy to answer any questions thank you uh, mr. Amon um, one question since it's fresh on the mind that uh, deputy director Solis mentioned is a little more clarity on the Viper system uh, and then a potential issue to that so first are we going to establish and actively advertise a non-emergency line now so to my understanding we do already advertise for both the fire department and the police department a tid digit administrative line it's also the line that's given to other surrounding agencies who might need to transfer in or notify us of a critical incident in their jurisdiction so that's uh that's been an operable line for quite some time but but currently that's handled just like a someone dialing 911 right right that's correct from our perspective yes so it's going to be advertised and operated now with this new system as a non-emergency line yes it was already advertised as non-emergency right uh, so yeah to your point yes we're going to do PSAs so we're currently working on what's going to be considered an emergency and what's a non-emergency so we'll have to train our staff to be able to identify um, during the triage of the call that in the event that there are calls in queue that this call can go over to non-emergency and be placed in a whole queue and we can continue to take calls so those things that are not um, in progress calls perpetrators just left the scene um, things of that will be considered emergency if not they'll be pushed to a non-emergency queue and then we'll be able to cycle back through those calls and then a few other issues uh, with that uh, we may want to establish a an emergency line other than 911 because an issue that came to my attention when I first entered neighborhood leadership you know district 9 about five miles of it borders Cobb County so if you're in my neighborhood for example or uh, some other na neighborhoods along Bolton Road you call 911 during emergency from your cell phone you get Cobb County so I go well I'm in Atlanta and then they route you to Fulton County and they're like I'm trying to get to Atlanta so okay a great three thing. minutes later you finally get to Atlanta um, and they get put on hold so can you how are we going to fix that with this new system so for for the purposes of this conversation we've really been kind of identifying just two cues but we actually are going to implement I think it's something like five cues so we've got a 911 queue a 10 digit emergency queue like you're talking about a 10 digit non-emergency queue a queue for alarm companies 
so forth, so on. That 10-digit emergency line is for the very purpose that you described. They've bounced into another jurisdiction and they need to be transferred back. That would be prioritized at the same level as a 911 call. And that would be uh, internal use only. You know, we're not doing PSAs with that number. We're asking our partner agencies to not, um, you know, publicly display that or give that out, um, you know, even to individuals that call them as the transfer line. So there, there is a multitude of configurations to this system that are much larger than just the two for the purposes of the conversation. And I'm, I'm happy to share that with you guys. And hopefully this will help, you know, to Mr. Amos's point, people will call 911 for some ridiculous reasons, but uh, you know, I, I found it almost equally ridiculous that we didn't, I was just large of a city, don't have a not emergency line because, you know, for example, oh, well, my car got broken into, you know, yesterday and I needed to get a report for insurance. And then they tried to not call 911 because this is an emergency, but then they call the precinct, you know, in my case, zone one or zone two. Either no one answers or two, well, if you want to report, you have to call 911 because an officer has to be dispatched out. Uh, so this is going to help with that issue as well, right? Sure. Yeah, and I don't disagree with you at all. I think the design is subpar and we're moving in the, the right direction. And so what are, I guess Ms., uh, Mr. Amon or whoever can answer this, what are our, our current staffing, or maybe it's better to address vacancy percentage right now and 911? Uh, how many graduated last week, and how many do we have in class? Yes, so I'll let the director answer that. Last week we had 10 graduates, so that was great. We were up from four um, in the previous graduation, and I will say that that has been a great um, morale booster to allow the dispatchers to graduate with the um, police officers. Right now we are about 24 short, and we really do need other positions, but I like to fill those before we start to add additional vacancies because then it just looks like we have a whole lot of vacancies. Um, we do have about 20 in background right now that are going through um, the APD HR background process and we're working diligently with background to get those people pushed through. And are all those vacancies currently posted? Yes, it is a recurring um, position and we have been attending job fairs, uh, we've been attending midnight basketball. Uh, we've been everywhere trying to recruit. What is the latest update? We've discussed the phone system with the electrical infrastructure system. Uh, what are the updates of it that have been made or are hopefully right. coming? Yeah, according to the scope of work, they're 50% finished, but um, that can be misleading because some of that 50% is the planning and the, the marking, earmarking of all the uh, electrical. Um, this month, they're supposed to be starting the rehabilitation of the chiller, um, and in September and October, they're slated to do the heavy lift on the electrical, so that's the replacement of the UPS, replacement of the generator, and then re replacement of the central console controller that that operates all of that so we're just now kind of getting underway with the the physical hardware updates and offhand do you know the uh, uh, full cost of those upgrades i i don't know offhand i can get you that number you just send that in sure. council member waits thank you mr chairman uh, my question was with respect to the public comment earlier regarding the uh, the intersection of raf mcgill and Cortland Street. Uh, I think this is directed to Chief Peak. Thank you, Director Arnold. Uh, with respect to the encampment, encampment, what is the plan to address that in addition to the vandalism that is occurring in the, the community that was referenced during the public comment? Do we have a plan for that? So yes, we will actually, and I actually have already shared my card for communication okay. so that I can follow up with uh, Principal uh, so we will certainly uh, do that. Um, in those situations, we will go out with a HOPE team and take resources out there and try to get those that we can divert to get them some out of the road, if, whether if it be um, mental illness or help or whatever the case may be, homelessness, where we're trying to find um, shelter for them. We'll try to do all of those and really and truly help them move out of those park areas. And we'll also have our uh, crime prevention inspectors go out to the specific location to look at some assessments, set tests, and figure out what we can do to uh, try to alleviate the issues of what's happening with that actual building. So we'll certainly follow up and address Thank it. Thank you, sir. And given the strain to the 911 system, what number should an individual call if they're dealing with something like this versus calling 911? Who should they reach out to? 
So at this for this particular case, naturally they could follow up with the um, precinct or they could reach out to our HOPE team. I know there are a number of different ways that can do that. So a streamline would be to actually contact the actual precinct itself and then they will internally reach out to us. But for, as we've already heard, for emergency situations, by no means if we don't want to confuse anybody if they need police help to call 911. Okay. But yes, we'll follow up and make sure that it's covered. Perfect, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, last question. Uh, last question, does the $4.5 million allotted help us at all? The new $4.5 million has been allotted. $4.5 million that was allotted. For PAD, excuse me. For PAD. Yes. So, um, With respect to the encampments and having resources to address these issues. So I have not had the opportunity of really and truly having that conversation with um, Moki Masias or how they will implement it. Um, we have a great relationship and we'll continue to work with them and try to get the uh, resources to the areas where we need. There are many, but I don't know the inner workings of how they budget that 4.5 million or how they plan to use it within their program. Okay, thank you. And, and Director Arnold, my last question, Mr. Chair, please. Are there any incentives for the 911 dispatchers? I know that other areas have had some type of incentives, watershed and other areas bonuses to bring individuals on. What incentives? Uh, currently, we are working on incentives for 911 operators as far as bringing them on with hopefully signing bonuses and things of that nature, but they don't currently exist. Thank you. Well, they do get to work with us, so there's that. But, uh, but in all seriousness, we are looking at a range of, of uh, different incentives. We clearly have not only the 20 odd some vacancies that were referred to earlier, but we have need for well beyond those vacancies. So as we are able to fill those, we will be coming back to you because we really want to hit the national standard of, uh, of response time, which is going to take even more than those 20 vacancies. So to fill those, we are going to need to look at the total rewards. And we'll be, we'll be back to you with some, some thoughts on that to get your advice and counsel and approval. Thank you, sir. I'd like to connect with you, given that there's supplemental funds in the 911 system, so I think that would be appropriate Absolutely. to use those for some type of bonus and incentive. Great. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you, Director. Thank you, Mr. Amon, for your remarks. Thank you, Chief Peak. Next, we'll move on to the PADS quarterly update. Moki Macias, Executive Director. Good afternoon. Pleasure to be here today. Um, yeah, so I appreciate the conversation related to 911 and APD because I, I do have um, a, a little more to add there, which I'm excited about our partnership um, with 911. But before I get into that, I um, just wanted to share with you all some of our numbers from this last most recent quarter, which is May through July. Um, and I apologize, the yellow on there is really hard to read. Um, but we can, I think, believe you all have that in your packet as well. Um, so just summary-wise, we have received 77 diversions um, for the quarter from the Atlanta Police Department, as well as our other law enforcement partners, which is MARTA and Georgia Tech at this point, 214 diversions from law enforcement to date. We've received 717 referrals through 311, so that's when a community member would call related to a disturbance related to public indecency to some of these other issues, um, and 397 in this quarter alone. Um, we've enrolled 86 people in care navigation services. These are folks that by and large come to us through law enforcement diversion and or have an open case in the city of Atlanta or Fulton County. So our wraparound incentive case management is really focused on those individuals who have an intersection with our criminal legal system so that we're able to try and reduce the incidences of arrest and incarceration there. Um, 385 total people um, are on our caseloads. And we've engaged 459 businesses. So a lot of the work that we do um, out in the community is really educating those folks that may in fact be the folks calling 911 um, when they could actually call 311 for a different kind of response, right? So we have those conversations with business owners and other community members to say, you know, if you have an issue that is non-emergent in nature, if it is not an acute issue that requires a police response, if somebody is 
causing a disturbance outside of your business um, or, or something related to a mental health or substance use concern, you can actually call 311 and our team will come out. So, um, so a big part of our work in the last, um, in these last six months has been to really get, just like hit the pavement and um, really start having those conversations with business owners as we look to expand our team. Um, I wanted to lift up a couple of our, of the stories of, for folks that we're working with. This is Maya. She became a PAD participant um, just last month. She has been struggling with years um, with substance use and homelessness, and she's currently working with us while she's in emergency housing. A few more things on our diversions. Um, I just want to highlight uh, consistently criminal trespass does tend to be the charge that um, that we receive the most diversions for. That, as we know, is a state charge that would otherwise go to Fulton County Jail. Um, Zone 5 consistently does produce the most diversions. And while you know, we want to see more diversions across every zone, we also recognize that Zone 5 has historically and today had the most quality of life and related 911 calls for service as well as arrest. So it's appropriate and we expect that Zone 5, given the sort of commercial and um, entertainment hub that it is, would produce the most diversions. Um, our average response time is 20 minutes. So, you know, we really prioritize when an officer reaches out to us that our team gets on the scene as quickly as possible. Officers are also able to um, bring individuals to our office, but, um, but we do try and get out to the scene as quickly as we can when we meet that call. Moving on to community response, as I shared, we accepted 397 calls through ATL 311 in this quarter. Our response time is um, currently 30.5 minutes. So these are for calls, about 90% of all calls were designated as an immediate response. And so that means once the 311 agent has sent it over to us, we are getting our team out the door so that we're showing up on the scene as quickly as possible. There are those calls that we designate as outreach requ requests. Um, so I know, you know we've worked, for example, closely with um, Councilmember Overstreet's office for uh, for individuals who they you know they're there frequently. The person knows that they'll be there, and we'll sort of coordinate with them to choose the correct time, um, time of day, as well as you know to identify a time where we can go out and and meet up with folks. So for the most part, we are doing immediate response, and then there are those that we'll schedule to do outreach with. Um, generally, basic needs uh, tends to be the highest. Uh, so that's folks calling about individuals who are you know, clearly have uh, a challenge meeting their basic needs, and we have an opportunity to help assist with that. But following that, we have disturbance and mental health as the, the other two calls that people make most frequently. And just wanted to share a caller testimonial here. Um, just, you know, in Zone 5, we got a um, really lovely response from one of our callers um, that just shared, you know, that she was able to not only have our team come out, um, but also that follow-up. So, you know, we have the capacity to then call back every person that calls us if they provide their information to let them know what we've done, answer their questions, help them identify other resources, et cetera. We have enrolled, and sorry, this is a little confusing here. We, we've enrolled 258 participants year to date, um, and that makes a total of 386 participants currently enrolled. And I wanted to lift up the housing support just because, you know, over 90% of the people that we serve are experiencing homelessness. And so, Certainly, one of the biggest resources we offer is connecting people to emergency shelter and to other forms of housing. So I wanted to, to lift up here that we've provided emergency housing to almost 200 people um, in the year to date, as well as temporary bridge housing. So that, that's for folks who are um, working through the process to receive a voucher or through to, to achieve other permanent housing. Um, we've been able to place 124 folks in bridge housing as well as 123 in residential substance use treatment. Um, at the same time, just to note, permanent supportive housing, 14 people have been placed, supportive housing, 46, um, and then veteran affairs, eight folks. 
Uh, th this is Bruce. He was diverted by law enforcement in January of 2021, um, and we have been working with him to achieve his documentation. As we all are aware, documentation can be a real barrier for folks who are seeking employment or seeking housing. He's actually a veteran, um, and so we were able to work with him to receive a um, for him to receive a veteran's. Uh, housing voucher. So um, once that process, you know, he w winded his way through the process, um, waited for an apartment to become available. He had been living on the street for six years before he was able to achieve his first apartment. I also wanted to mention that, you know, we've been working diligently on getting the Center for Diversion and Services up and running. Uh, so working closely with the city, with the county, Grady, and the Georgia Justice Project, sort of the core partners on this. Um, we've conducted three sessions with community members who could potentially use the center, right? Folks who are formerly incarcerated, folks who um, you know, our PAD participants are connected to some of our other agency partners. And we had about 200 people respond to a survey we put out to really ask people to think about what would it look like to walk in those doors? How do they want it to look and feel so that they would be willing to accept services and engage with um, the folks who are there to be able to get more stable? Um, overwhelmingly, what folks said that they would like to see is help finding housing and mental health services, which we were, um, you know, which tracks with the work that we're doing currently. This is just a, um, a response from one of the survey respondents, um, as well as some of our partners at Grady Hospital, actually conducting surveys with folks on the street. That's a photo there. Um, so just to say that, you know, for this person, their daughter has gone from jail into 1013, which is, you know, a, a, um, basically um, required assessment, let me say it that way. So required assessment at the hospital and was charged and convicted with a felony in a psychotic state. Um, you know, so not only are folks who would use the center talking about what this could mean to divert people from jail 24-7, but also their family members, also their loved ones, right, um, to be able to really engage um, in a different way when they have something going on for them that could result in an escalation. So that is the end here of my presentation, but I did want to note just a just one thing that we're also really excited about related to um, our partnership with 911. So our team, the 311 team and the 911 team have worked together to be able to identify those calls that could be diverted from the 911 system into the 311 system for a pad response. So, you know, really have enjoyed working with Director Arnold, Deputy Director Solis, and of course, Director Quarles at 311. Um, we are set to launch that in September. So September 1st, we'll expect that public indecency calls that fit, fit the criteria that hit the 911 system will actually be transferred over to 311. Uh, so not only does that relieve some pressure on the 911 system for calls that they don't then need to handle, but our hope and expectation is that as callers realize, hey, I don't actually have to call 911, but I can call 311 instead during 311 operating hours, um, that they will make that shift themselves. So there's a little bit of a double um, opportunity there. So we're looking forward to doing that. Um, and, and hopefully that as the pilot will be something we can build on to transfer more calls out of the 911 system that really could be going to 311. One thing I'd like to note there is that, you know, for the calls that we've looked at that, you know, we feel might be appropriate for that kind of transfer, uh, typically the response time that's, out, that's uh, you know, designated for those types of calls is between the 20 to 50 minute window from, from 911, right? Clearly the call takers recognize that these calls are not in need of a five to ten minute response, right, or an all call response. These are really the calls that would, you know, if somebody calls 911, probably result in an officer coming out, um, you know, 30 minutes to an hour later. So we're really focusing in on those kinds of calls so we can keep just being a little bit more strategic about those calls that really can just go straight into the 311 system for an alternate response. That's it. Thank you. Colleagues, questions, comments? Councilmember White. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you actually answered my question with respect to the collaboration between 311. 
My other question becomes, given the challenges that we're having or the concerns that we've raised with respect to the Fulton County uh, memorandum or some type of understanding or whatever the collaboration is, how can we lean forward given that we know that there are a number of individuals who are in the Fulton County facility that qualify for PAD services to work on getting those individuals transferred over sooner uh, versus uh, individuals who may be violent and so forth. And I'm referring to those who are awaiting a mental competency evaluation, those individuals who are waiting on a, a court backlog or needing specialty housing services such as health, uh, alcohol, drug treatment, things of that nature. So how can we lean forward and get a list of those individuals so that we can be proactive during this 90-day period of time? Sure, yeah, thank you for that question. Um, so. We have already we already have a partnership established with our criminal legal partners at Fulton County um, to be able to accept diversions from the jail. So to date, we've accepted 34 jail releases. Um, for the most part, these are individuals who are waiting for a housing placement, and that's kind of you know why they're stuck there. Um, you know, we're ready and willing to do more of those. Uh, you know, we've we are we have a planned conversation with our solicitor. Um, we are working closely with our public defender, um, and certainly with with Superior Court. And so, you know, I do think um, to the extent that those individuals are identified through this jail population review process or by any of our criminal legal partners, um, we absolutely we have the protocol in place. We absolutely can um, accept jail releases as long as you know we're able to provide the kind of services that they need I will note that there are those individuals who need a higher level of care than we're able to provide right so folks that really should be um, you know connected to in inpatient care right that's kind of beyond our um, our wheelhouse but I do think there's an opportunity to try and just lift up those individuals and that's something that we do with our familiar faces project which is also a partnership with Fulton County and Grady Hospital um, you know I think we can take sort of the template from familiar faces and really use that for more, to broaden that so that we can serve more people who need to be released from Fulton County Jail. Uh, I do think there is an opportunity there to just make sure that we have the kind of housing that is needed um, and the kind of other inpatient resources that are needed for some of those individuals as well. Uh, Councilmember Woods. Next, Councilmember Bond. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for your presentation. Uh, I wasn't aware of it, but I, uh, I became aware you all have a similar contract with Fulton County, uh, with like what you have with us, the mayor's office. That's correct, right? You all receive funding from them. We do receive funding from Fulton County. The funding that we receive from Fulton County is for direct services for individuals that we're working with. So that's housing services, uh, transportation assistance, food assistance, other direct services. Our contract with the city really covers staffing to provide community response and law enforcement assisted diversion. Oh, so you don't do for Fulton County necessarily what you do for us. We certainly accept diversions from the Atlanta Police Department, which is the highest arresting agency for Fulton County. But otherwise, I'm not sure what you mean. No, what I'm saying is that you have a contract with us, and you describe those services, and you say you receive funding from Fulton County. Is it a contract with Fulton County, or are you a grant recipient? We receive funding from Fulton County through the uh, Fulton Department of Behavioral Health. So you're, you're a grant recipient? Okay. And I guess my next question was, are there any other agencies or governments, well, I'm sorry, are there any other governments that you have similar contracts with other than Atlanta? No, sir. And so I guess you all received, uh, I guess, a, a, is it a four times increase on the funding you received from City of Atlanta this year prior to the last year? Three times, so it's 1.5 to 4.5. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what is the expansion of services? What are you using the increase for? Mm -hmm. Thank you for that question. Um, so as as I know y'all are aware, we have increased our staffing exponentially in order to provide citywide services over the last couple of years, right? So we went in 2020, we went from a staff of 11 
to now a staff of just under 40. The investment that the city of Atlanta is making is really to expand that staffing so that we're able, we're doubling our care navigation team, which means doubling the number of people who can be on our caseloads, and we're doubling our harm reduction response team. So these are the folks that literally respond in the field to either law enforcement or to individuals through the 311 line. So whereas before this expansion, um, we had five teams that were citywide responding to calls from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. during the week, we will now be um, able to serve with 10 teams who are able to respond citywide um, throughout the week. Have you expanded your hours of operation beyond 7 to 7? So the reason that our hours are 7 to 7 is because that is when the 3 and one call center operates. We don't run our own call center. It's a partnership with the city. So at this point, our community referrals have to come through the 311 call center line. At the time when 311 is able to expand, you know, that's something that we're really excited to do. At this point, however, we are working with APD to offer limited weekend hours just for law enforcement. So law enforcement calls us through a dedicated line that is only for law enforcement. Um, and we're, we are working with them to look at a pilot for, di for um, being able to accept diversions during the weekend hours, because we know that's a need. Well, since you've already got a contract, and we've already signed off on your contract and your funding, I want to, I'm really stating this for going forward, is that in my experience in law enforcement, the worst shifts are three to 11, 11 to seven. And so the, I think the benefit of your contract is being missed uh, in a huge way. Uh, when I worked in law enforcement, I worked 11 to 7 and never saw the light of day, you know, coming with I'd see this, I'd only see the sun coming up when I was leaving. But the human needs from 3 to 7 in the morning, I'm sure Deputy Chief Pete, farewell of this too. I mean, nothing good happens at night. And so if, if we're not having the benefit of that service, overnight we're missing a lot of good we could be doing our human population here in Atlanta a lot of bad things happen at night yeah thank you for that so I do want to note that you know we we're a data-driven program and we've we've always used both AP, APD arrest data as well as often call for service data to designate our um, response our response hours for APD um, you know what we have seen in the APD arrest data is that the majority of arrests do actually happen during business hours on weekdays for particularly quality of life type of offenses. And so that is actually what we're working on now as we work with W Chief Sensor um, to identify the appropriate weekend hours. In our preliminary analysis, it was actually um, the, it was actually weekday or excuse me weekend daytime hours where the most arrests were occurring. So we really want to make sure that our response time. Uh, uh, window, if you will, is tracked to actually when arrests happen. And what we see is for, for the kinds of calls that are divertible to PAD, it actually is um, squarely within the hours that we currently offer, as well as some hours within the weekend days. But I'm happy to provide that data as well. Well, I mean, that, that's great. I mean, there are more people awake during the day, so the mm -hmm. opportunity for crime to happen more during the day, because you got more people up and around, is great but there's still a lot that happens overnight. And I would strongly hope and suggest that you all would begin to look at a model that will allow you to operate overnight. Uh, because like I said, in my personal experience, what we see, and you know, it may not be as many criminal trespassing arrests occurring from 11 to seven, but there's still a lot of human beings, particularly in my experience, those with the kind of issues that could be addressed by PAD, folks that are homeless, that aren't in shelters, people that are having mental health breakdowns and their families are reaching out or calling for help in the middle of the night often when this kind of stuff happens. I mean, there needs to be some type of resource there if we're going to be increasing the funding and increasing the staffing. So I hope that you would look, look at that and the, those who have responsibility for managing this contract will also look at that uh, because just because something happens more often during the day you got 40 extra people 
you know, you could stretch those people around around the clock, in, in particular, and be available. If 311 is not open, right, after 7 p.m., which in itself is a whole other issue, right? Uh, but if you got a direct line from APD, if somebody needs a referral at 8 o'clock or at 3, 3 a.m., they need to be able to get to somebody because they could defer a person that might otherwise end up in either one of these facilities. Uh, so I hope you will c consider that. Uh, and then two, at some point, the administration, and I've raised this with administration officials, you know, legally the city just can't keep operating giving you all a annual contract. At some point, we're going to have to def do an RFP for a request for services because even though I voted for PAD and have supported PAD the entire time, and plan to continue to support PAD. I think that we're getting into a situation where we can't just keep offering you a sole source contract, you know, without going out to bid at some point. And so that's why I was asking a question about how, what is Fulton County, what is your relationship with Fulton County, how are they doing it? But you're just a grant recipient from them, right? So you just, so that's not the same type of they can continue to give you a grant year in and year out, but we're offering you a contract off, you know, you're getting access to the city's uh, capital and materials and space, and, you know, there's no state regulatory. I mean, we just can't keep doing that. There has to, it's, it's gonna have to change how you gain access or compete uh, for this contract. The last thing I want to ask is how do you all follow up with individuals who you've referred so that we can get a real number so we can, I guess, juxtapose when these calls for your referral services are made and how effective, so we can judge how effective those services are. Because if, if a police officer or a store owner calls you, how do you follow, what is your process for following up? Is it 30 days, six months? I mean, how, you know, how do you do that so that we can better make a determination of the, to judge the effectiveness of the, of the referral? Sure, yeah, and, and I do just want to note, you know, a big part of the reason that we've been working so hard and so diligently on this 24-7 diversion center is, in fact, to provide a 24-hour alternative to jail. So I couldn't agree with you more that it is a needed resource, um, and we are excited for that to continue and to continue to build. So, you know, I think there is um, certainly, there's no argument there that we need a 24-hour option, um, and that, you know, we have to build up towards that, clearly. Um, in terms of the follow-up with Folks who call us through 311, um, we respond to that caller within 48 hours. And so any caller who provides their information to 311, that's provided to us, and then we'll respond to that caller and let them know what has occurred. I mean, do you follow up with the individuals again after you've had that initial contact, or you just kind of triage them where they are, and then you're just moving on to the next call? You mean the folks that that we respond to who may have some sort of need? Right. Exactly. Oh, you're, I'm sorry. Customer, yes, sure. Yes. Sure, yeah. So when our team goes out, we will go out and make an initial offer, you know, try and find out what's going on with them, what they may need. That might look like transporting them. You know, I know we've had, we had somebody in our office the other day who um, we ended up bringing him back to the office because he had a sister that he needed to reconnect with. We were able to get on the phone with the sister and she was actually able to go get him, to come get him, excuse me. So, you know, it really depends on the person. Uh, it, we may be transporting that person. We may be offering them food or clothing. Um, but our, for every person that we see, our intent and our mission is to get them connected to any resource that they need. That may mean for many folks, they're already connected to a housing navigator through another agency, for example. It may mean that um, you know, we can offer them shelter op options and transport them there or provide them a MARTA card to get there. So it really depends on the person. For any person that has an open case in the city of Atlanta or Fulton County, we'll ask for their permission to, to review that. Um, and then if we identify that they do have an open case, we'll be, we're able to enroll them in longer term cases 
case management. For the folks that we do enroll in longer term case management, that is, um, you know, tends to be weekly case management. Um, we will go to them or they can come to us. We provide emergency shelter, we provide transportation and food assistance as well as connection to behavioral health care and, and you know, basically any other resource they need. Um, you know, that said, that is the same level of support that we provide to anybody who's diverted from law enforcement as well. I mean, so how do you, do you follow up with them in 30 days to check to see how they're doing or is it six months? I mean, that's what I'm asking, is that once you've made that initial connection to whether it's a family member or program or agency, do you follow up any time after that to check, just to check on them to see what their status is? If we enroll them in case management, we are then connected to them. If we are meeting their immediate need and getting them connected elsewhere, we're no longer doing follow-up with that person. We're not tracking their, we're not taking their information or tracking who they, you know, who they are, where they're connected to. Uh, more often than not, though, you know, when there's an individual who, say, isn't interested in assistance, but we know they're going to be in the area, um, we will end up going out. Sometimes it's once a week, sometimes it's once a month when our team's in the area. But, you know, there's, there's always those individuals individuals who, um, who may be really attached to the specific area that they're in, may not be interested in seeking shelter that's outside of that neighborhood, and those are the folks we really prioritize to go back and visit with. So we, d we do that consistently with folks that may not have left the area, but do, you know, that we know we need to keep engaging. Well, it would be my hope in the future that you all would standardize the practice of the follow-up, because that helps to judge how for us who are on the outside looking in and have the obligation to examine and scrutinize and exercise oversight, I don't know about anybody else, but it would help me to say, hey, because of PAD, this person is doing X, Y, Z. They're either better or they're worse or they're, you know, they found it they're with their family. Um, so that, that would help me. Right, and that's what we do for folks we've actually enrolled as participants. So any data that you have related to participants or folks that we enroll, right? For for the folks that we respond to a, a call about, that is, it, it's more of a alternate response model, right? We are responding to the, to the current issue. We're helping to resolve that current issue. You know, if we were to enroll every person in case management, that would be a uh, substantially different budget. No, I'm, I'm not suggesting that. What I'm just saying is that any person that you touch, that, you know, whether it's a 30-day check or six-month check, beyond this contract, if there's another one, you know, and I, I assume that they would, would be, that something be incorporated in the contract that allows that follow-up. Because in my experience as a counselor, a community activist, law enforcement person, you know, it's great to try to pull the, you know, the, to stop the babies from flowing down the river, but at some point you have to go and see who's throwing the babies in. So you got to go check, you know, and, and go and examine, you know, and follow up with people because most of the people that I've come across with either through my church or through activism who are, who are homeless, independent, and we all have our anecdotal stories, uh, but the, it's, it's the broken relationships that contribute to people being in the situation sometimes that they're in. And so I'm, I'm hoping, you know, I don't anticipate PAD going away, but this is just a suggestion I have, you know, that there probably does need to be more established uh, follow-up with these, with these individuals to keep them connected. And, you know, I appreciate the mention of uh, making sure that we have a diversion center in Atlanta. Uh, but I guess the question becomes, or it's been answered, but the question for me always is where? Because if the interest is setting up shop immediately, the city of Atlanta for the last decade has had hundreds of thousands of square feet of empty space at community centers, rec centers, empty buildings all over Atlanta. And so I've said that to advocates and activists all along, that if you want a space to start, uh, you know, you start anywhere. And we've got empty space to do that in every place. 
Yeah, thank you for that. You know, I, I do, I want, I want to just remind us um, that, you know, we've been working on this for the last five years. I, we did attempt to put the Diversion Center in four different locations before actually landing at um, the ACDC facility. Um, that said, you know, I know we're, we're just about, the architectural designs are just about done. Um, there is, you know, we're, we're, we're pretty far down the path at, um, at opening this in the b bottom there of ACDC. Um, that said, I know that there are there is a huge need for walk-in resource centers, um, as well as you know potentially other locations for diversion centers. So I would welcome if any if any council member has a location in their district that you would be willing to explore the ability to do a 24/7 walk-in center, um, we would be happy to partner with you and have those conversations. Well, I represent the whole city, so I've got space everywhere. Right. Let's that, let's see. But you know, I'm not going to belabor it. But uh, I thank you for answering my question. But just in the general uh, ether, uh, you know, there there do, there do need to be spaces that are not attached to a jail, uh, because that's a trauma in and of itself for some people to return to a facility, particularly if they've been uh, housed in that facility. Uh, there's a lot of anxiety and uh, apprehension for folks to kind of trust what might go on there, despite, you know, smiling faces that may be there welcoming them. And we might, we do need to look at alternatives that are better adjacent to MARTA that have absolute parking, because in all the good discussions about ACDC, there's no parking over there. You can't get over there uh, unless you're going to ride a Greyhound bus, <laughs> you know. But there's no parking over there. They need to be centrally located within communities where these issues are occurring and, these, and a lot of these folks live or have established attachments. But I appreciate you indulging my questions today. I withdraw, Mr. Chair. Councilman Robeshrude. Thank you. Um, okay, so I have a couple questions. Thank, thank you for your, your um, update, also your briefing. Um, so I did learn something today. I, I know I was told by a couple people that there was a um, pre-arrest diversion option at Fulton County also because I've often said that, you know, the city needs to be in the business of doing city business and city services with, their, with our tax base and the county needs to be in the business of doing the county work with their tax base um, and that the city doesn't have a health and human services um, division because the county does and vice versa and I've been really diligently trying to uh, communicate this to my constituents and educate them on how everything works and so today I you know I can see how people are very confused the constituents because it you know I'm realizing that when I was told that there was already a pre-arrest diversion um, component in place for the city through Fulton County that it's the same entity. I didn't know that until today. I really didn't. Do, do they call, do you all operate as um, pre-arrest diversion or policing alternatives there? What, what do you operate as there? Because I know when we first started this, you know, back in, you know, with the pilot program, I think it was pre-arrest. Yeah, I, and I'm happy to share this with you, but um, the so PAD is the coordinating entity for the Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion Initiative, mm -hmm. which is a joint partnership between the City of Atlanta and Fulton County, the District Attorney's Office, and Solicitor Keith Gamage's Office. So really, the, the, the initiative as a whole, the ability to divert people pre-arrest from either ACDC or Fulton County Jail is a joint effort between the city and the county. Mm -hmm. So so the service that we provide is to coordinate the operational working group, which is the monthly coordination meeting between all of both city and county entities, and to provide the case management, care navigation, direct services for those individuals who are diverted through law enforcement. So, got it. And, and I think I kind of knew a little bit of that. I just didn't realize that our tax bases were being 
commingled, per se, because it's, so it's important to me that I'm able to really educate our, our constituents on who is responsible for what. And it really is just that simple, you know. Um, when you don't have that defined well, there are loopholes that are always, um, they, they prevail. And that's not what I want. So I really want to be able to better understand, and it's, it's probably not a conversation for right this moment. I understand that. Um, before we even begin our next budget season, which to me is going to start January 2023, I want to better understand what the city is responsible for what the county is responsible for, because I think that's going to help us in deciding who needs to pay for what and what that actually looks like. Because from what I just heard today, it sounds like um, we may be sharing staffing. Is, we're not? No, so, so the 40 people that are on the staffing for the 4.5 million that we are paying for has nothing to do with what happens with Fulton County. So law enforcement assisted diversion is to divert individuals through the Atlanta Police Department. Because the Atlanta Police Department is the largest arresting agency in Fulton County, the Ful Fulton County has seen it to be useful to the county to partner in this effort to divert people from Fulton County Jail. Right? So we're not accepting diversions from other places. We're accepting diversions from the Atlanta Police Department, from MARTA Police within the city of Atlanta, and from Georgia Tech. Right? So the diversions are all connected to these agencies within the city of Atlanta. Now, of course, because APD diverts, or excuse me, books at either the city of Atlanta jail or the Fulton County jail, we're able to divert from both of those uh, facilities, right? We're on both city and state charges. So that's, that's the reason that as a whole, and you know, which is reflective of you know, other programs around the country, that you need your city and your county agencies to be in collaboration because it's the same I, arresting agency. I agree agency. with that part. Um, again, I'm still just talking about tax base and money that we're responsible for, like fiduciary responsibilities of the city. So um, does Fulton County, uh, their public safety uh, officials, do they share the 40 um, staff members? Are they, do they use any of, any of the diversion? Um, you know, do they use the staff at all from seven to seven, Monday through Friday? So we don't accept diversions from Fulton County Sheriff's Office. Okay, if that, that's that, the question. That that's partially the yeah. question. Yes. So no. Okay. Um, and now back to what our 4.5 actually covers, because you know I, I see now I, I do need to drill down more with with that other, and I don't mind meeting about that, um, but. We have 29 extra positions funded, right? Because you said it was 11 last year, and we've, we're moving up to 40, correct? No, I can provide you the full list that are funded through the City of Atlanta grant. I don't, I'm sorry, I don't have that in front of me, but I can, I can provide that with you. What I was saying with the 11 is that we started from 11 in 2020, and our team has grown to what will be 70 this year. And that's 70? a mix of private dollars as well as public dollars. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when we were at 11 positions, though, that was 1.5 million? Is that our pilot program year? No, that was... That was before we actually bumped up to 1.5. So the first, so we were receiving 400,000 dollars, 400,000 from the city of Atlanta in 2019, mm -hmm. 1.9 in 2020, 1.5 in 2021, and then this this explosion. So 2019 was the 11 mm -hmm. positions, mm -hmm. and when we went up to 1.7 or 1.5, how many positions did we find that year? I'd have to look at that because the 
actual budget that was funded was not strictly for positions. So it's not like a one-to-one, -one, but I can provide that to you. Okay, because, you know, if you're doing the math, jumping up from 1.5 to um, 4.5, that's a $3 million difference. And you said most of it went to just staffing. So I just want to understand that because if you do that uh, math, it is like a hundred thousand per staff member over the eleven. I'm and happy so to provide the details in terms of what the budget covers. Certainly, you know, with a seventy-person staff, that's also additional. Well, we're not at operations. seventy yet, right? Where are you now? With this right now, coming today, through, today. today? 38. 38. So but not we haven't seven. hired for any of the new positions yet because we don't yet have the contract in hand. Okay. All right. So, I, you know, I'm going to use this year to really figure out, um, you know, what makes the most sense for all entities um, and understand better how we can make sure that city services um, are you know, we're, we're just being the best fiduciaries that we can with our city services and with the money, our tax base, that's the funding that's provided to us. So we'll just keep talking about it because I, and oh, I, I do want to touch on the output. So I, before Council Member Bond was speaking, um, I actually wrote out also that output is important because we want to know if we're spending our tax base the right way. Um, and because I know that I have um, a couple areas that are, you know, persistent. And, you know, I'm sure you all get the same calls all the time for uh, these areas. And I had a private donor to come and clear out, like totally clear out, um, an area that my constituents were really upset about because it really is, you know, private land. And so that criminal trespassing is a real thing. I can understand why that would be the number one um, reason for you all to show up on the case. Um, but having them spend $3,500 to clear that space out for it to already be back. Um, and the, the guy to insist that they should stay when we've offered, you know, you, you all came out um, and we've offered, I just want to know how effective it is. You know what I mean? I want to make sure that we're doing um, the right thing with, with our tax dollars. That's all. So the output is important to me also. I want to know, are we revisiting and revisiting? And because I've not called you back about it yet. Um, does that mean that, that you don't know about it? I think that's what Council Member Bond was reaching into also. Like what kind of outputs are we, what, what's the output of, of what the work that you're doing? What's the output of our um, investment in this pre-arrest uh, or policing alternatives? We just want to know that kind of information also. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And, and we do send a monthly report to all council. Um, and, and I see it, but it's, it's still is not touching on exactly what we're asking you here today. Yeah, so I, I, as I was going to say, you know, if, if there are metrics that you'd like us to consider including, mm -hmm. I'm very happy to, to me about it, very happy if you want to send me an email, um, and we can see what other additional metrics we can provide. I will say, you know, in terms of doing, um, basically, because, because we are citywide, and we have five teams currently and are growing to 10 teams, I just want to acknowledge that, you know, if our teams, that's basically, it's, it's expecting 10 teams to literally do outreach across the entire city, uh, you know, consistently. That's likely not going to happen, right? We will likely continue to be responsive to requests in the same way that the Atlanta Police Department is responsive to requests, right? They're not following up 
um, with people that they got a phone call about uh, based on every 911 call they received. So, you know, just, just, I just want a level set in terms of what other alternate response teams are doing across the country, that it really is an alternate first response. It is not a um, first and forever more response, right? And so I just, you know, I think we want to work, and I think we've, we've really, with the follow-up with callers in particular, we've really made that offer to callers and to, you know, to your office and to others that, hey, if you see an issue, call us back. We no, want to we we call every, every month or that if, if, if nothing is changing in that particular situation, we should constantly try to help him. Is that correct? I can call you again. I really can. We welcome you to call us okay. again. Absolutely. You can, in, you know, feel free to just shoot me an email. We can get our team back out there. I will say that, you know, as a consent-based program, our team can show up. We can offer resources. We can engage that individual. But at the end of the day, if what you're looking for is, is enforcement, or you know, law enforcement, then I would have to defer to our partners at APD. But he's not, well, see, this is, this is the thing. I mean, is he a criminal? Because he's, you know, living on someone else's property? You know what I mean? So that's where your expertise comes in. And we're, we're happy to show back up. I mean, we're, we're, we're never, there's never gonna be a point where we're like, well, you know, too bad, we tried. If you continue to see the issue, we're happy to show back up. Okay. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, um, thank you. And it is time for us to just circle back and, and I'll be setting that, that up. I, I really want to um, stay close. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Any other questions, colleagues? For Pat. All right. Thank you. Thank you for the update. Next, our final presentation is the quarterly update from Atlanta Citizen Review Board. Uh, Samuel Lee Reed, Executive Director. Thank you for joining us. Good afternoon, Council Members, uh, Committee Members. Thank you for having me today. Uh, okay. So in the, um, before I get started in the quarterly report, Dad, I want to just briefly go over what the Atlanta Citizen Review Board is and our jurisdiction so we can make sure that citizens understand what we do and how we do our work. Um, the ACRB is an independent investigative agency of the City of Atlanta authorized to investigate um, citizen complaints against Atlanta police officers. We do our work fairly thoroughly and independently uh, with integrity in mind. Uh, we're about uh, promoting having the best officers on the street. As it relates to our jurisdictional um, requirements, a complaint must involve an Atlanta police or corrections officer. It must be filed within 365 days of the incident. It can be filed anonymously. It must be signed unless anonymous or it's an agency-initiated investigation. The agency can, can self-initiate an investigation if it involves a uh, officer involved shooting or taser use where death or serious bodily injury occurs. The accepted allegations are abuse of authority, abuse of language, appropriate action required, conduct, discrimination, discriminatory references, failure to provide identification, false arrest, false imprisonment, harassment, retaliation, use of excessive force involving serious bodily injury or death, and any violation of the Atlanta Police Department's standard operating procedures. Now I'd like to get to the uh, fourth quarter data for FY22. As you see on the slides, we see 36 complaints uh, signed for full investigation with 13. Of those 36 complaints, 19 were dismissed because they involved um, officers from other jurisdictions. We had four complaints awaiting a signed complaint. Uh, the complaints came from uh, APD zones one and four received 53%, I mean 58% of the complaints, and council districts three, nine, and 11 received 53% of the complaints. The investigators closed nine investiga I mean six investigations and had 28 investigations open. Our investigative timeline was 176 days. When we look at the quarter, the top two allegations were appropriate action required, which involved false arrest failure to act, inadequate investigation, and adequate service. 
that was followed by violation of department standard operating procedures, which involved um, illegal search, illegal entry, tight handcuffs where no injuries occurred, and failure to follow arrest procedures. Other allegations that were received during the quarter were excessive force, which involved guns drawn and pointed at person, push, drag, uh, person who pushed and dragged, abuse of authority, harassment, failure to provide ID and false imprisonment. And when we look at the use of force data, specifically those uh, incidents that involved officer-involved shootings, we see seven notifications during a quarter. Uh, when we look at the zones, there were two in zones, four, two in zone, two, one in zone five, one in fugitive unit, and one in the gang unit. As broken down by the council districts, it was two in District 7, one each in Districts 2, 9, 11, and 12, and one occurred outside of Atlanta uh, involving a fugitive unit. I do want to make a note here. And when we look at the officer involved shootings, we don't initiate our investigation on those incidents until the GBI and the APD have completed their investigations. We've um, found that's the best way to make sure that we don't put any potential criminal um, charges uh, in jeopardy. So we'll do the administrative investigation once those investigations have wrapped up. As it relates to the board's work in the fourth quarter, uh, the board had three meetings and one panel review. They adjudicated eight complaints. The allegations adjudicated were 21. The board sustained 52% of the allegations that came before it. And there were nine completed investigations awaiting a hearing at the, at the end of June 30th. Um, I want to mention about the APD's responses on ACRB sustained allegations. This is the the um, data that citizens are most concerned about. Um, January through June 22, the APD agreed with 88% of the sustained allegations were accepted. Mind you, that seven accepted, zero, accept, zero rejected, and one not addressed. That was 18 allegations still pending. So we still have some that's out there, but they are making progress and getting those to us. As an update to 2021, when I was last here, um, we had not received any uh, responses, but since that time, they have re returned responses to us. And right now, with 2021, our allegations of 69% rate of agreement, um, with 25 still pending. So the message here is that when we look at civilian oversight, when you're talking about rates of agreement like that, it shows that civilian oversight works, especially when you have the police department and the uh, agency being able to work in tandem as they look at the allegations to determine that an officer uh, violated the, the uh, violated policy. So we are um, we are glad to see those numbers trending the way that they are. Um, our goal is always to be 75%, understanding that the police department has this discretion of how it wants to uh, deal with its officers. But when we're looking at 88% and 69%, uh, that's, that's really good. We'll... Okay, so, um, Community outreach and engagement. This is an area that we do uh, beyond just the community, beyond the complaint investigations. Um, we understand that awareness of the agency uh, instills trust, and uh, it's important that citizens have a familiarity of the agency so that they will use us when they have uh, concerns about an officers' actions. During the quarter, uh, the ACRB participated in 51 outreach events, and uh, some of those events are listed up there on the on the um, slide. Um, Count Best Friends, Green Rock Mall, uh, the Mobile Outreach Unit, Tuesday Night Talks Podcast, the Clippers and Cops, uh, Midnight Basketball, etc. I want to say thank you all 
to um, our ACRB volunteers. Uh, Sarita Morrison, Natasha and Santasha, Madison and Cameron Mitchell. These Integrity Street team members answered the call when we needed them. They helped supplement our staff efforts to provide community engagement to, um, to the citizens. I also want to acknowledge the uh, community outreach team staff um, for their, their work in this area. Um, the team is led by Miles Smith and including staff members Naomi Bowman, Melissa Jean Baptiste, and Charles Curry. So I wanted to, I wanted to uh, speak also to um, ACRB and the youth. It's critically important that as we educate adult community members that we start having these conversations with the youth as well about uh, proper police interactions. Uh, during the summer, the AC made presentations to uh, camp, camp best friends, summer campers, uh, throughout the summer program. Uh, the presentations were taught taught the campers about proper police interactions and awareness of the agency. We used our uh, mascot, Justice Crusader, who you see in the picture here, who broke down the conversations in age-appropriate uh, conversations so that they could share that information amongst themselves, but also with their family members. Uh, the other program involving the youth was our Educators Fellows Program, where we had the culminating event uh, in in April, no, in May. Um, and that program involved the Atlanta Public Schools students at four different schools um, to increase their understanding of proper interactions with police officers. And they did a nice um, video skit of what they learned and participating in question and answers to demonstrate their understanding of what police interactions, what proper police interactions look like. Our mobile outreach program is really about being able to go out into the community so people can see us. They can see the vehicle, they can understand that we're here for them, that if they have concerns, they can contact us. Um, we believe that we, we don't want citizens trying to handle situations out on the street with an officer file a complaint. We'll investigate it and we'll determine what happened. Um, the mobile unit logged 2,327 miles last year, I mean, last quarter, and um, we're going to continue to just have this vehicle out in the community, handing out materials, having conversations with citizens so that they know that we're here. I want to, uh, before I wrap up, I want to just give you a couple of um, agency updates. Um, we'll be moving to our new location before the end of the year. We'll still be in City Hall and the City Hall Tower on the first floor. Um, we're currently on the ninth floor. Um, we've outgrown that space and uh, it would increase our visibility within City Hall to have us on the first floor. So that should be happening by the end of the year. The ACRB has this public portal that should be going online soon. This is a way to provide greater access to citizens um, to be able to file their complaints and also to be able to track their complaints as they go through the system. Uh, we are also looking and working on updating the agency information on the City of Atlanta's webpage. It's, uh, it needs an update and on the 311 website. So those are things that we're currently working on as well. Um, with that, that would conclude my uh, quarterly report. I just want to say again, for citizens of Atlanta, you have a concern or question about the officers, the actions of a, an Atlanta, Atlanta police or corrections officer, that you contact us at 404-865-8622. Um, we're always looking for volunteers, so you can contact us about that as well. Um, Thank you. If you all have any questions, I'll take those questions now. Thank you, Director Reed. Colleagues, questions, comments? Yes, sir. Um, yes. Thank you for everything you're doing. Thank you for the data. Um, let's go to page five. Um, very good data. And, and when I read it, APD zones one and four, district 
Council District 3. I immediately just wanted to pick up the phone, call Chief Peak, and he's sitting right there, and Major Mormon. But then I start to dig a little deeper. If you look at this, immediately I'm thinking, we got an issue. What I would like to see, um, if you would, is out of these, let's say, 58 complaints, what was substantiated, what was adjudicated, and what was dismissed. Because that is what's missing. Although it's listed here, it doesn't, it doesn't, I guess, single out that 58% or that 53%. And I don't want my constituents looking at that or me looking at this and saying we got a serious problem in District 3. Well, let me say this first of all. Any complaint, one complaint is one too many. But this just seems like when you hear 58% and 53%, it just sent us into a whole nother ram that I would like not to be in. So if you can just add that, it'll be. Yes. And the, the, the data that you're referring to here, 58% and 53%, those are the complaints we received. And then they're um, triaged down into the ones that we will actually investigate. And then there's a, a further reduction, or I shouldn't say reduction, but um, as they go through the process and the board actually makes a decision on them to say if it's been sustained or not, meaning that the officer uh, violated policy, then it gets back to um, the number of allegations that we we're talking about on slide eight. And so we can certainly break those down when we're looking at where did these uh, sustained allegations come from because that would be the number that would say okay how's the problem looking in this area when it relates to those sustained complaints certainly the not sustained does give us information because not sustained means that well we Don't mean didn't have enough happen. information right. to really say that it did it did not happen uh, but the sustained we know we had enough information to say something happened so we could break that down, yes. And I did follow up with uh, APD on, on, on a number that you were looking for last um, quarter um, related to contacts in, the, in that area. And uh, for District 3, um, there were calls of service right around 19,000 calls of services. And, and it's just not clear correlation, but District 3 was also in this number last month, I mean last quarter, about the number of percentage of, of uh, complaints we received in that area. So uh, 19,000 um, complaints in the district. Um, unfortunately, I didn't break down the number of complaints from District 3 on this one, but it's, it's nowhere near a large number. Okay. And, and thank you, and also I'm glad you get a new office space. Oh, thank you. Yes. Oh, you, yeah. You, you came your last right. office. <laughs> right. Right. Any other questions for Director Reed? Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Updates. All right. That concludes our presentations. We'll move on to communications. Our first item is 22C5136, and uh, this appointee is not present and we're going to hold this until the September 12th meeting. Can you read that in? A communication from Christopher Leitner, President of Atlanta Bar Association, submitting the appointment for Ms. Jenna Lee to serve as a member of the Alcohol Technical Advisory Group, ATAG-3. Motion to hold. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councilmember Boone. Please prepare the vote. The vote is open. Vote. The vote is closed. Six yeas, zero nays. That item is held. On to our consent agenda and claims of favorable and unfavorable recommendations. I'll make a motion to accept all favorable claims, items one through three. Is there a second? Second. Second, second by Councilmember Norwood. Please prepare the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. A zero nays. Those items are favorable. 
Now make a motion to adverse on unfavorable claims. Items one, or excuse me, items four through thirty-one. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councilmember Overstreet. Please prepare the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Six yeas, zero nays. Those items are adverse. On to our regular agenda, ordinances for second reading. And item number one is 220-1662. An ordinance by Council Members Alex Juan, Liliana Bactiari, Antonio Lewis, Matt Westmoreland, and Keisha Sean Waits to waive the provisions of Chapter 10, Article 2, Section 10-209 C&D of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Atlanta, Georgia, so as to modify the hours of operation during the days of October 7, 2022 through October 10, 2022, Atlanta Pride Weekend only for all licensed establishments authorized to sell alcoholic beverages for on-premises consumption and for the purposes. Make an amendment to add my name as a co-sponsor. Any others? Councilmember Boone. Amos Overstreet. Boom. Council Member Bond. So I will make that motion. Is there a second? Second. Second by Council Member Amos. Please prepare the vote on the amendment. The vote is open. The vote is closed. 68 0 nays. Amendment is approved. I'll make a motion to a Approve as amended. Is there a second? Second. Second by Council Member Amos. Please prepare the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Yes, zero nays. That item is approved as amended. Item number two, 220 An ordinance by Council Member Michael Julian Bond authorizing the mayor or his designee to waive section 2-1163C Article 10 of the Procurement and Real Estate Code of the City of Atlanta Code of Ordinances to ratify services rendered in connection with FC 7522 Inmate Pharmacy Services with correct RX Pharmacy Services Incorporated on behalf of the Department of Corrections to enter into amendment number one on a month-to-month -month basis for a period not to exceed 12 months. Retroactively effective August 11, 2022 through August 10, 2023 in an amount not to exceed $350,000 and zero cents. All costs shall be charged to and paid from the accounts listed herein and for the purposes. Motion to approve. Is there a second? Second by Council Member Bond. Please prepare the vote. The vote is open. <laughs> the vote is closed. Six yeas, zero nays. That item is approved. Item number three, twenty-two oh sixteen sixty-eight. An ordinance by Council Member Michael Julian Bond authorizing the mayor or his designee to waive Section 2-1163C, Article 10 of the Procurement and Real Estate Code of the City of Atlanta Code of Ordinances, to ratify services rendered in connection with FC 7175 Inmate Dental Services with Quality Plan Administrators Incorporated on behalf of the Department of Corrections on a month-to-month -month basis, retroactively effective September 3, 2022 through September 2, 2023, and continuing on a monthly basis for a period not to exceed 12 months in, a, in, in an amount not to exceed $138,381.96. All funds shall be charged to and paid from the accounts listed herein and for the purposes. Make a motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. Second by Council Member Bond. Please prepare the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Seven yeas, zero nays. Seven yeas, zero nays. That item is favorable. Item number four, twenty-two oh sixteen eighty. An ordinance by Council Member Andrea L. Boone authorizing the mayor or his designee on behalf of the City of Atlanta Police Department to execute a lease assignment 
with the Atlanta Police Foundation for the lease of space at the Electrical Workers Home Association of Atlanta Incorporated, property located at 540 Central Avenue Southwest, Suite A, Atlanta, Georgia, 30312, Fulton County, consisting of 8,132 rentable square feet for a term of 120 months, authorizing a rental rate of $227,696.04, with an annual escalation of 3.5%, beginning at the end of the first year, authorizing the expenditure to be charged to and paid from the fund department organization and account numbers listed herein and for other purposes. Motion approved by Council Member Boone. Is there a second? Second. Second by Council Member Overstreet. Um, I did have a question about this, but it doesn't appear we have anyone from ABD, APD present. I know they're dealing with a situation in Midtown, um, but um, we do have a motion and a second. Please prepare the vote. The vote is open. Please vote. The vote is closed. 78 zero nays. That item is favorable. Item number 5, 220 I understand we have a substitution for that. Yes, Mr. Chair, one moment. I need a motion to bring the substitute forth, Mr. Chair. It sh the caption changes. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councilmember Norwood. Please prepare the vote on the substitute. The vote is open. Please vote. The vote is closed. 78 zero nays. Substitute is before us. An ordinance to amend Chapter 10, Article 2, Sections 10-92B of the City of Atlanta Code of Ordinances so as to provide an exemption from the distance requirements listed in Section 10-88.1 for package stores licensed to sell malt beverages and or wine for an establishment located at 1015 Chester Avenue Southeast, Atlanta, Georgia, 30316 and for other purposes. Uh, anyone with a motion? Approval. Motion to approve by Councilmember Boone. Is there a second? Second, second by Councilmember Waits. Please prepare the vote. The vote is open. Please vote. vote is closed. 6 a zero nays on abstention. Item is favorable on substitute. Before we progress, I did want to go back to the legislation about the APD um, lease. Um, since you have rejoined us, Deputy Chief. Yes. Uh, the Central Avenue lease. 540 Central Avenue, I believe the address was. What is that facility used for or will be used for? I don't know if it's current. 540 Central Avenue will be used for our special operations section. Um, as you all know, they're at 180 South Side right now, and that building is just really dilapidated and falling in as we speak. So uh, they're trying to, as soon as possible, um, affect that lease. There are a number of other agencies that were really and truly trying to get this exact same space for what we're doing. For now, it will be conducive for us to go ahead and try to move into that facility so that we'll have adequate spacing for our special operations section, which is going to consist of our motors, our uh, high-intensity traffic heat unit through the governor's program, and another other initiatives and units that are in that building. But it's a, it's a critical space that we really and truly need to get them out of that condition out there. Maintains adequate parking for all those units? Yes, it, it, it is. Now, it will be somewhat uh, tight. We won't have the same amount of spacing, but we've worked out a great plan with the actual uh, owners of the property to where when there are specialized events where we'll have an enormous amount of resources that we have a plan already worked out to uh, provide adequate parking on site. So it will be a great spot for us. When will the move occur? 
as soon as we can. Uh, I believe they're actually on the build out now trying to make all the preparations. I was out on site uh, probably Thursday or Friday of last week. So as soon as we can uh, get everything in place, everything will move forward. So I think it's projected to have probably about a three-month build out to it. So given once this move is complete, do we have any uh, APD resources still on the south side? Or that not? should be it. That will clear us out of south side industrial altogether. And is, do we currently have a lease on that? or So that one is owned still by Atlanta Public School System, so we're in there that month-to-month -month deal till we can get out of that building. Okay. Um, and do you know the cost of that lease? I do not know the cost of the old or the new one will be about 224000 if I can remember, yearly. About 224000 yearly. All right. Thanks for answering those questions. Um, Deputy Chief, appreciate it. Thank you. I'm joined by Councilmember Lewis. Welcome. Mr. Chair, um, that item is also um, a dual referred item and will be forwarded to the Finance Executive Committee. The lease item? Yes. Okay. Item number four. Thank you. We'll leave that moves us to resolutions. We'll start with item number six, 22R4178. A resolution by Council Member Dustin Hill is authorizing the mayor or his designee to accept on behalf of the Atlanta Police Department a donation from the Atlanta Police Foundation of five 2021 Ford Interceptor Explorers valued at approximately $183,750.00 for the use of additional Atlanta Police Department vehicles in order to augment the police presence through the City of Atlanta and for other purposes. Motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. Second by Council Member Norwood. Please refer the vote. Councilmember Wace, did you have a question about this item or a previous item? Previous item. Okay. So uh, let's wait for the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. 78 0 nays. That item is favorable. Councilmember Wace. Yes, sir. I was pulled out by one of the Black Pride organizers, and it was germane to an ordinance that's already been approved here, 22-01662. And the ask is to include uh, Labor Day weekend in that, given that it's Black Broad weekend. And so we were just simply try to, trying to add that language. Is it possible? We've already done, I we have already done legislation for Labor Day. Oh, you did? Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. my apologies to everyone. Thank you, sir. Well, next item is item number seven, 22R4184. A resolution by Councilmember Antonio Lewis urging the Georgia General Assembly to review and amend its statutes to specifically limit using rap lyrics as evidence in criminal trials and for other purposes. Member Lewis, you've joined us. You're the author of this legislation. Would you like to speak? Yes. Uh, so first, I want to say thank you for uh, recognizing me. And I want to go right into the uh, Part of the reason why we introduced this was to make sure that we had a state legislation that could match the federal legislation that uh, Congressman Hank Johnston introduced. Uh, Congress shall make no law abridging from freedom of speech. Freddie Mercury, Mercury did not confess to having just killed a man by putting a gun against his head and pulling the trigger. Bob Marley did not confess to having shot a sheriff. And Johnny Cash did not confess to shooting a man in Reno just to watch him die. To get even closer, Johnny Depp uh, played in blow. Not one time was George Young mentioned in his trial. Johnny Blepp, Depp played in Powers of the Caribbean. Not one time was Captain George Sparrow and the drunken ways and the womanizing ways mentioned in his trial against his wife. Uh, currently, Alec Baldwin, uh, he, he's, 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 he was He's been charged of uh, holding the gun that killed the actress, and he said he didn't pull the trigger. Not one time during his trial will they talk about Brooklyn rules in which he was Caesar Gambino, and he killed multiple people. So I just want to make sure that we know that rap is, rap is actually one of the, prosecutors have used rappers' arts in at least 500 times in the past 30 years, with thousands of similar prosecutions going unreported. No other form of music of art, including heavy metal with music themes of cannibalism and ritualized torture, has musicians prosecuted for their art. We have to find a way to, here in the city of Atlanta to create the box in which the prosecutors can work from. That's what we're trying to do right here in the city of Atlanta. So we're trying to make sure that the state is able to do the same thing that 
uh, Representative Hank Johnson and Jamal Bowman, uh, two progressive members of Congress, are doing on the federal level. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Questions from colleagues? Comments? Council Member Norwood? I'd like to make a motion to hold this. I think it needs more discussion than we're able to do today. For a second. I second, um, Mr. Chair. Second by Council Member Amos. Please prepare the vote. This is a motion to hold. Motion by Council Member Norwood. Second by Council Member Amos. The vote is open. Please vote. The vote is closed. Right. Six yeas, one nay. That item will be held in committee. Can I speak? Yes, Council Member. I will say that this was us urging the state legislator to do it what our Congressperson Hank Johnson and what our other Congressperson was signed on to. We're urging our state legislators, City Council is urging our state legislators to do with our U.S. Congress people that we've elected are trying to do nationally because this is Atlanta. Young black folk that look like me that are not wearing a suit, those are going to be the people that are going to prosecute for this. So this is Atlanta, and we cannot let this happen in Atlanta. So thank you. Councilmember Waits. Mr. Lewis, I thank you for your thoughtful legislation. Um, and I do think that this is the appropriate committee. Uh, and what I would suggest is that you come back to the committee and make the argument in the case. I think that the legislation has some very uh, good points and I think that we just simply need a little bit more time uh, to vet it and to understand clearly what your intent is. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Council Member Waits, any other questions, concerns? All right. Thank you, Council Member Lewis. Uh, moving on, if we could, since there are both uh, reemployments under Section 3-505B, if we could take item number 8 and 9 together, please. A resolution by Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee authorizing the reemployment of City of Atlanta retiree police investigator Cedric Smith in the Atlanta Police Department for annual compensation not to exceed $66,705.60 pursuant to Section 3-505B of the Charter of the City of Atlanta and for other purposes. A resolution by Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee authorizing the reemployment of City of Atlanta retiree police investigator Stephen Schrecken, Schreckenghost in the Atlanta Police Department for an annual compensation not to exceed $66,726.40 pursuant to Section 3-505B of the Charter of the City of Atlanta and for other purposes. Motion to approve those two items. Is there a second? Second by Councilmember Overstreet. Please prepare the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Six yeas, zero nays, one abstention. Mr. Chair, I have a question, actually. Uh, uh, Councilmember Ramos. Um, major, I'm um, Major. Uh, Chief Pete, please. Um, I believe in recapturing. I believe in using the best knowledge. What do we have in place to once our people retire that we don't have to recapture them, that we are building the next best and brightest? Because I think it's 30 years you guys have to work. So if you come on at 20, 30 years later, 50, what are we doing to not have to see a paper like this again? So with the recapture program is twofold. For right now, it gives us the availability of getting the resources and the expertise that we need in those places. But another piece or requirement to that is that that knowledge that they have of training others so that when we have the uh, staffing in place that we take that knowledge and we pass it on and we continue to build so that when we are really and truly moving people out of a position that we have great continuity and leadership in knowing that we're getting the best for the Atlanta Police Department and our citizens. So it is thoughtful and we thank you for that consideration. It's critical right now for us to move forward, but yes, we are training those that's coming up behind so that ultimately we'll have some Cedric Smiths or Shrek and Ghosts with different names and different looks that will continue to keep their uh, their work moving forward. 
Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Amos. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll take item number 10, 22R4228. A resolution by Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee to rescind resolution number 22R3889 to authorize a payment in the amount of $20,000.00 to David Dollar in settlement of all claims against the City of Atlanta related to a sewer incident alleged to have occurred on April 16, 2020 and for other purposes. Motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councilmember Boone. Please prepare the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Okay, zero nays. That item is favorable. We'll take items number 11 through 14 as a block. Is there all settlements? Please read those in. A resolution by Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee authorizing the settlement of all claims against defendants, City of Atlanta, in the case of Virginstein, Seiyang, and the Pearl Academy Incorporated versus City of Atlanta, Civil File, Civil Action File Number 2020 CV 340508, pending in the Superior Court of Fulton County, Georgia, in the amount of $123,000.00. Authorizing the settlement amount to be charged to and paid from the accounts listed herein, authorizing the chief financial officer to distribute the settlement amount and for other purposes. A resolution by Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee authorizing the settlement of all claims against the City of Atlanta in the case of Luvinia Bradley versus City of Atlanta, Civil, file, civil Action File Number 2021, CV 345095, Fulton County Superior Court, in the amount of $50,000, authorizing said amount to be paid as follows from the, accounts, the account numbers listed herein, authorizing the Chief Financial Officer to distribute the total settlement amount and for other purposes. A resolution by a Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee authorizing the settlement of all claims against defendant City of Atlanta in the case of Yuri Agbachev versus City of Atlanta Civil Action File Number 20 EV 003620 pending in the State Court of Fulton County, Georgia in the amount of $70,000.00 authorizing the settlement amount to be charged to and paid from the accounts numbers listed herein authorizing the Chief Financial Officer to distribute the settlement amount and for other purposes. A resolution by a Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee authorizing the settlement of all claims against the in the case of Nicardo McInnes versus City of Atlanta, Civil Action File Number 19 EV005346, pending in the State Court of Fulton County of Georgia, in the amount of $92,500.00, authorizing the settlement amount to be charged to and paid from the account numbers listed herein, authorizing the Chief Financial Officer to distribute the settlement amount and for other purposes. Make a motion to approve those items. Is there a second? Second, second by Councilmember Overstreet. Please prepare the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Right. 78 0 nays. Those items 11 through 14 are favorable. I believe that completes our legislative agenda for the day. Uh, questions, comments uh, from colleagues? Councilmember Waits. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We want to recognize our community leader. Have you already done so? Coco Dunstan, her husband. Did you want to? Please. Uh, we want to recognize Coco Dunstan uh, lost her husband this weekend, Fleetwood uh, Dunstan. So we want to send prayers and condolences to the family. Thank you so much. Councilmember Byrne. Anyone else? All right. Yeah, we do. Uh, yeah, you have an. Uh, you have any updates on the active shooter situation in Midtown, Deputy Chief Pete? You come to the podium. So we we have a enormous amount of resources out at the scene. Um, they have an identification, and so in the process of locating the assailant is responsible. So it's, a, it's the scene itself is secure. We just have the necessary people in place to make the uh, location of the uh, suspect. Thank you, and everyone can look for further updates on our social media. It's going to be keeping keeping updated quite well there. Absolutely, we'll be pushing information out. What are your comments, Mr. Member Wait. Yes, sir. Chief Peak. 
These are reoccurring themes in Atlanta, and I guess my question is, what actions are we taking to lean forward to send a very strong message to community that this type of behavior is just not acceptable? So what are we doing in terms of leaning forward when we have these types of dynamics? And I'm very clear that you can't control everything that happens uh, in our city, but we're just seeing historical patterns of violence all over the city. Right, right. So I think it's going to have to be a community collective event with, um, of course, law enforcement partnering with our houses of worship, partnering with other community people that are influential, as well as uh, the violence reduction plan so that we really get it out there and get people the help that they need. Unfortunately, in today's time, it seems as though any slight argument over the least amount of things leads to gunfire. And so... We're seeing the increase in domestic incidents. I mean, they're not things, we, we see things in open air, but we see even more within closed homes and within office parks, different things like such across the nation. So uh, we really and truly just got to really reach out and have honest conversations and get the resources for the people that we can identify need to help. But on the front side for law enforcement purposes, we have to be consistent with what we're doing, uh, arresting the right people and really and truly showing us why we see our homicide clear up rates are extremely high. We're good at what we're doing, but we have to change the culture and the mindset of the people that are involved. So uh, it's a challenge, but we're up to the uh, test on it to continue to move forward. We're in a better place than a lot of other places, but we're not happy with what we're seeing. So we'll continue to prosecute those that need to be prosecuted. Mr. Chair, final thought. Thank you, sir. Question, uh, you mentioned House of Worship. I love that idea. I'd like to partner with you in terms of reaching out to some of the local churches here in Atlanta uh, to utilize the pastors to spread this message to community. Absolutely. Look forward to it. I know we have the Faith in Blue um, initiative that's coming up in early October, I believe, October 9th and 10th, where we'll be partnering with several houses of worship throughout the uh, city. Um, but more so than just this one event, we have to have something constantly moving within our community so that we're and truly this does not become a law enforcement issue. This is a social issue and really prior to us getting it, there are some other things that are happening within the home. So uh, we certainly uh, welcome any and all to uh, change the culture and the activities that we're seeing. Councilman Ramos. Actually, just picking back off that, and um, thank you, Ashley, because of your leadership, um, Councilman Waits and Ashley Norwood, with the Public Service Commission and the quadrants that we have. I mean, those are perfect opportunities. I was just talking to my staff about how we're going to reintroduce and talk to um, our majors in the zone and actually begin to bring more people together around the schools and the after-school tutorial program. So that's a perfect vehicle um, that we already have in place to actually get it done. We just need to get people to it. So thank wow. you. And just to share two things and to kind of back up some of the comments that you said, you know, I've had a number of issues, you know, murders, aggravated assaults in my district behind closed doors uh, and multifamily housing. Uh, so I think we really have to step up APD, the solicitor's office, etc. cetera. Um, I think Council Member Boone can attest to this. She's been on top of the nuisance issues at apartments in her district. Um, but we have to work with these apartment owners, many who are absentee. Uh, just thinking of, you know, two or three of mine. There's one that a company out of Virginia owns, a company out of California, a company actually out of Ontario, Canada, right. uh, that owns uh, a complex where an event this morning occurred behind closed doors after a night of drug-induced psychosis. Um, and, you know, how do we police that? We've got to work with these uh, apartment owners. Uh, to get them to realize you know, who is on their roles, what is happening behind their closed doors and in their parking garages. Absolutely. And also, just to share, um, which I can now, uh, just some praise. I was uh, selected to be on a criminal jury uh, about a week and a half ago in a trial that lasted three days. And just I got to see another perspective of the work that APD does, our district attorney's office, the courts, and the public defender's office. So uh, just, uh, again, got to see a different perspective, and everyone uh, all sides did a great job. So just uh, want to share that praise there. Thank you so much. I'll be sure to take it back. Thank you. If that is all, we will be adjourned by unanimous consent of members present.
Thank you.